Hello and welcome to episode 250 of Retro Encounter, RPG fans podcast of many topics. I'm Mike Solosi, and this is a milestone episode, so we're going to get a little weird, uh, but it's also going to be the same as episode 150. So let's introduce the panel, starting with Joe Padilla. Howdy. Alana Hagues. Hey. Zach Wilkerson. Howdy. And Peter Treisenberg. Hey, yeah. Uh- so, 250 episodes. Um, I had no idea how long this podcast was ever going to last, and if you had told me in 2015 that we were going to be recording at least 250, I would have been truly shocked. So I am uh, happy and humbled to get, reach this milestone with uh, the four of you who each joined RPG Fan a different year, but have been four of the biggest supporters of the podcast from within staff. So thank you. And, uh, and and thank the listeners for at least listening enough for me to continue. Hey, it's been fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, 250 is going to be just like 150. We've been soliciting for uh, reader emails for the past, oh, I don't know, something like eight weeks. And um, we've collected about 15 or 16 emails from listeners. Uh, they gave us a, a bunch of great questions that we're going to go over as many as we can. And uh, we also asked for them to provide suggestions for future Retro Encounter games. And they gave us about uh, 55 or 60 suggestions, which I put in the Google Docs so the four of you can check um, during the podcast uh, or whenever you like. It's a a pretty long list. And they did a pretty good job of not repeating anything we've had on the podcast before. So uh, we we will... uh, we will mention them throughout the episode, but also read through that list at the end uh, to decide on a future retro encounter game that I think is going to be either the December 2020 or January 2021 game. We will figure it out when we come to it. But f- uh, before then, we have about 15 emails. So, um, Alana, can you read this email from Matt M.? Uh, yeah, of course. So before I go on, Matt M is a contributor at RP Gamer. So thank you so much for emailing us. It's great to have one of our sibling sites email. And also they host their own Dragon Quest podcast as well, which is great. A Dragon Quest Slime Time is really fun. So I recommend you go and listen to it if you're a Dragon Quest fan or you're curious. Um, but he says, uh, love your show. Um, I have a few suggestions for you all. I'm not 100% sure you've done some of them. And there's quite a few here, so these make up quite a big chunk of our list. So we've got any Dragon Quest game, uh, which is nearly all of them. (laughs) We've only covered five officially as a game journal, and we've done 11 as a spoiler cast, but it's still a little bit new. Uh, We've got any Grandia, so that's 2, 3, and... uh, I can't remember. Extreme? Yep, Grandia Extreme without an E at the beginning. Uh, of course. Um, Rune Factory as would be amazing, especially for... Rune Factory falls on Switch now, so that's pretty accessible. Uh, and Fantasy Life, which... Blimey, you've sunk 120 hours into, which I did not know it was that deep. Um, and he says, thank you for all the hours of entertainment. Um, more than 50 hours by my app's count. I've only got into the podcast about 14 months ago, so while we were on a bit of a hiatus. But thank you so much, and congratulations on your awesome milestones. So... Thank you, Matt. This is some really great suggestions. Yeah, there's quite a few suggestions. Um, I have barely played any farming games ever. It's a genre that's mostly escaped me. To my knowledge, Fantasy Life is like half farmer and half dungeon crawler, where you basically change jobs and do whichever task the job entails, and you can sort of level up all the jobs in your little RPG town. Pretty much. It's pretty much, yeah. It was uh, it was by level five, so the, the guys who did uh, Dark Cloud and Nino Cooney and all that stuff... Um, and I've heard, yeah, it's a, one of those, it's a really charming 3DS game. Um, I haven't played it myself, but from what I've heard, it's one of those, the system's kind of hidden gems. Uh, it could be interesting to visit, revisit for the show. And I know that, uh, um, Mar- RPG fan former staffer Marcos Gaspar is a huge fan of Rune Factory 4. So, uh, mm. um, in fact, it, it was him yeah. talking about it that made me make it a question on a, on a, uh, on a trivia episode from last year. <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you, yeah. Matt, for that uh, for that nice email. But we got to move on. Uh, Zach, how about you read this email from Aaron? Uh, so yeah, um, so Aaron, uh, thanks uh, for listening. I know you're a big supporter of the show. Um, uh, you know, he interacts with Mike and Alana a lot on Twitter and also on our Discord. So thank you for your support. Um, so here's Aaron's email. Um, so thanks for continuing to delve into the realms of games past in a world where many sources of content are diminished or have outright disappeared. It's been nice to have a consistent set of discussions on a topic I enjoy and regularly partake in. For example, I recently played Terra Enigma to fill in that gap both in my own play history and my retro encounter listening history. 
Um, and so he also has a suggestion. Um, he says he's covered a lot of, we've already covered a lot of Aaron's favorites. Um, but he suggests that we play Phantom Brave, which is an NIS tactical game. Um, that's grown on Aaron over the years. Cool. Well, thank you, Aaron. Um, I played a little bit of Phantom Brave on the PS2, but never finished it. But me being a, a fake Nipponichi fan who professes to love all their games, but has really only beaten Disgaea ones. Um, <laughs> Phantom Brave, uh, Lana, maybe you wouldn't be quite as apprehensive about Phantom Brave because it is a strategy RPG, but there are no squares. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, right? I've just beaten a strategy RPG. With, with squares, even. So uh, th- 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 yeah. th- that's true. By square, even. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So there's so many squares. How did you ever make it through it, Alana? <laughs> Lots of coffee. How did you walk over all those squares? Lots of coffee. <laughs> um, Phantom Brave is cool. It's it's weirdly tragic because th- this uh, it, it it's about this girl who's ostracized by her little town because she's a spirit medium and all her friends are ghosts. So. Uh, uh, again, I didn't get too far in it, but for at least parts of the beginning, it, it feels like the saddest strategy RPG in the world because it's about the loneliness of this girl who's like, uh, with only her ghost friends, is trying to, uh, you know, uh, save the world or, or at least solve a series of problems escalating to probably saving the world. But it, but it was cool. I, it's a game I wouldn't mind revisiting. Yeah, it's definitely that brand of Nipponichi weird, isn't it? Like. I, it's got a really similar art style to Disgaea, and at one point I got them confused. But yeah, I think it got a I think it got a Steam port recently as well, a couple of years ago. So again, it's not out of the realms of accessibility or anything. Yeah, at least I think it also got a, I think it also got a Wii port at one point, didn't it? <laughs> I, oh I God. think it might have gotten a Wii port. I thought it was maybe on the PSP eventually. Uh, I'd have to double check that, but um, I, I don't think an access issue would be that troublesome for Phantom Brave. So uh, thanks for the suggestion, Aaron. Um, I'll read this next email. Uh, uh, Michael W. has been a big fan of the podcast for a long time. He met our contingent at E3 a couple times, so he's one of the few listeners I've met in person. Uh, and, and he's a delightful person and sent a delightful and extremely detailed email. Um, he sent three questions and about 25 game suggestions. So I... Uh, and, and I'll, I'll just go with those game suggestions first. Uh, I, I will mention all the game suggestions at the end, but the ones that Mike wrote include Rogue Galaxy, Thousand Arms, Magical Vacation, 3D Dot Game Heroes, Bloodborne, and even Sonic Chronicles the Dark Brotherhood. Uh, one of these is not like the others. Run away! Run away! But anyway... Mike, Mike W. likes pain. But listeners, if you hear a game that we mention at the end that we don't, you don't think was mentioned in another email, it was probably one of Michael W.'s suggestions. Um, so let's go with his three questions he sent us. I'll read them all three at once, and then we can address them one at a time. Uh, question one, in a world devoid of all forms of gaming, what other vice would you pick up as a free time replacement? It's like gar- gardening or learning how to play harpsichord. Uh, question two, if you could personally fully fund or manage a, a game to the quality level of the Final Fantasy VII remake to reboot any one series or make a dream sequel or spinoff, what game or series would it be for, and how would you like it to be done? And his suggestion would be like, uh, uh, like a, a, a new Persona game led by Yoko Taro, or a new Shadow Hearts game with the original development team, or something completely different like Cadence of Hyrule. So that's a sort of a spin-off remake question. And the th- last question: What is your personal favorite game that, or that you've played, or best experience you've had for Retro Encounter? So, question one: What would you have your What would your hobby be to replace video games? I'm gonna adjust my answer and say if I were to replace video games and podcasting, my two largest time, most time consuming hobbies, uh, I I think I would take up the piano again. Um, I, I, I I played piano and drums for many years uh, for school and personally, and I've mostly fallen off it. And it makes me a little sad when I go downstairs and look at my packed up uh, practice xylophone and key and electronic keyboards. I, I would, I think I would take up playing the piano again. Keep my fingers warm. Anyone else uh, have their replacement hobby? I'd probably just read a lot more. Um, I because I have I, I I love I love reading books. I've um, especially fantasy literature, but I just haven't had as much time to do it as I as I would like uh, nowadays. So you know, in the absence of my other time sink, um, I'd probably just catch up on some of these these uh, books that are staring at me from my shelf. Yeah, I mean, my answer is probably pretty similar. I uh, I would probably watch a lot more movies. I mean, like I, 
do that a lot already. Um, but that's probably the thing that would take up the most of my time. Although I do like one of, uh, Mike's suggestions, which is extreme cocaine use. Um, <laughs> so that also, that also might be my choice. That is maybe, um, that just, en- that's maybe the, that the just one. That enhances the experience. That's one suggestion in there that would be a- absolutely as money consuming as video games, if not worse. Exactly. <laughs> Gotta have a balance, I, I guess. I'm just, I'm just saying, getting high and watching the first Pokemon movie was a trip. Jeez. Sadly, in a, word, in a world I, devoid of gaming, we can't combine cocaine and res, or cocaine and jet set radio. That's tragic. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> I t- you know, I tell you that, the, that one of the worst movie-watching experiences of my life was me being the, uh, the only person not on some sort of substance in a room of, like, six watching Sweeney Todd. Um, oh, man. <laughs> I mean, did, did I just, it get like a little Sweetie Todd in there eventually? I mean, that's a real question. Like, well, uh, yeah, well, you had the you had one person who was just freaking out about what was happening on the screen. I had one friend who just kept asking me for snacks with like within the context of Sweeney Todd. You really don't want to think about food, um, yeah, right? <laughs> so more hot so, pies. So it it is not the uh, yeah. Yeah, especially if it, luckily, luckily that person did not ask for meat pies, or I would have just jumped, like it just jumped out the window into a different building or something. Uh, just <laughs> army rolled into my neighbor's apartment. So while someone was singing "I Feel You, Johanna," everyone in the room besides you was feeling something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wow. I was just, I was just sitting there twiddling my thumbs, just ba 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 ba, you know. Um, I um so as some people know I sing uh, I perform and such and so um, that's kind of my other thing. But if I wasn't uh, doing that either, I guess I would get more into uh, designing clothes, like making my own um, making my own clothes and such. Because uh, oh. I really like I like fashion. I like um, putting together patterns, and uh, I'm not the best at it. So I'd like to get better. But That'd games. Be in- be interesting. <laughs> mm. Well, Joe actually took my answer, so I would do <laughs> oh, that no. as well. Um, no, no, no. Um, there's two things I do. Like, I think learn to sew properly would be one of them because my mum sews quite a lot, so it's something I'd like to adopt and take up. But I don't like sewing machines; they freak me out a little bit. So, I'd like to learn how to make my own clothes because, again, I really like fashion and I like really kind of weird cute prints so i would probably make a lot of my own stuff um the other thing i would do and something i regret from school is not taking cookery classes um i can cook and i can bake and i really like doing both so i would probably do make that a hobby and i mean really like the perfect job would be to run some kind of if video games existed in this world and i was even better at cooking than i am because i'm just average i would like to run a food blog based on video games but like I'm not going to do that because I'm not incredible at it and I'm not confident enough. But yeah, if video games didn't exist, then I would definitely put, I'd probably go back to school, go to college and take some cookery classes and get even better at it. So we should yeah. all just, we should all just quit our jobs and open up a video game themed restaurant. Yeah, Alana, partway through your explanation, I thought you were going to say you wanted to open a video game themed bakery and I'll, and I'll be just, I'll, str- I'll stroll yeah. and say, give me all your slime cupcakes, all of them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I would love to do that. Yeah, um, I have done chocobo cupcakes. I frequently make birthday cakes for my friends out of video game stuff. Nothing too expensive, but or too extravagant. But yeah, I, I love doing it. It's fun, and I'm not the best at decorating stuff and that. But like, it genuinely is really nice to do. I find it really stress relieving and very rewarding when people are like, oh, "That's really good. You're the best at this," and I'm like, "I'm not, but thank you." So yeah, I'd love to get better at it. <laughs> All right, so only one of us half chose cocaine. That's, that's probably that, that, that probably goes well to how well adjusted the panel is uh, for this episode. But um, Mike's next question about um, about remaking a game if you uh, had unlimited time and budget. Uh, I, I I'm going back to this article that I saw many years ago. I think I think it was like after Near Automata had come out and Dragon Quest XI was upcoming. And like the, the, Yoko Taro mentioned loving Dragon Quest as a kid, and there's oh. there's a picture of him just staring sadly yes. into a slime plushie, and and <laughs> I'm, and, I'm, and I'm like, God. this is a man who genuinely cares about Dragon Quest and could definitely make the weirdest, most emotional Dragon Quest game ever made. So I, I would want oh, I, I would want a traditional RPG 
Dragon Quest with all the Dragon Quest traditions, but with Yuji Horii retiring and t- passing the torch to Yoko Taro and making the wildest Dragon Quest game ever made. That, 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 that's, that's what can I you, want. Yeah. Can, can we also can get we, the composer as oh, well? Yeah. Yeah, I was just oh, yeah. Let's get Okabe. Let's, yes, let's, let's get Okabe and, and oh. ditch, ditch Sugiyama. Please. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine Act 3 of Dragon Quest Eleven with Yoko oh Taro? God. Like, what on earth? I want... Yeah, uh, I, I mean, it would just be Act 2 again. No, 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 no. I, yeah. I, want, I want Act 1 <laughs> Act one exactly as it is. Act 2 by Yoko Taro, and then Act 3... Oh man, what, what what do we even do with Act Three? Like uh, uh, Act Three by whoever wrote whoever wrote uh, Professor Layton in the last time travel. <laughs> oh no! Oh. <laughs> or or Ow. a um it's- or a Dragon Quest Twelve made by Yoko Taro based on Dragon Quest Your Story. No. Oh. Yes. It would, be, it would be better than the film, to be fair. <laughs> it, it, oh, it I liked the film. <laughs> It was I okay. Liked the film. It was okay. It was okay. Wait, no. It, it was the pretty, film. That, that's the nicest thing I can say about it. It had pretty great. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I'm changing my answer. Uh, part one, exactly the same. Part two, Yoko Taro. Part three, Kotaro Uchikoshi, allowing you to jump timelines to change whatever you want. <laughs> there we go. Oh that's the Dragon Quest game I want. I was going to say Uchikoshi, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that what I would really want would be a... Spirit Social success- Successor to Suikoden, made by Mariyama. Huh. Oh, wait. Oh, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> wait a second. Are we, are we all yeah. just NPCs in Zach's dream right now and for the past several weeks? In this, in this hypothetical situation, would it go to Kickstarter and make almost $3 million? I think that would probably be the way it would go. I don't know. I mean, like, I, it would probably have, like, you know, maybe like 100 heroes in this case. Oh, yeah. it's 106 at the moment. Actually. Yeah, yeah, and then I like, know. and then like, Ko- and then like Koji Igarashi shows up as like the final boss <laughs> in the video. And it was Give amazing. me Necklord. <laughs> All right, can you fanboys chill out? That's never going to happen. Come on, I know. this is ridiculous. I know. Look, it's the it's the only good thing to happen this year. Let me have this. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically this and that one video I found of baby crocodiles are the only good things I've had that's happened in 2020. <laughs> yeah, I know what one you think. <laughs> yeah, it's it's slim pickings right now. In all in all sincerity, like my answer would have been Sweet in Six, and this is as close as we're ever gonna get. And oh man, like I, many of these people know how excited I was. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and yeah, you aren't the only Sweet in fan and RPG fan who's finding a way to bring it up every day. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, Mark, <laughs> I I would say for for mine, um, it would be um, Vagrant Story with um, um, with Matsuno returning as co-director with Miyazaki from FromSoft and made as a collaboration between Square and FromSoft. Mm, yeah, oh. that would be so Matsuno good. Matsuno ideas and the... Vagrant Story ideas in a Soulsborne framework is very exciting. It, would, would this be? That would be I think, would this be a remake or a sequel, Joe? Um, I think. I mean, either would work. But I think the original game is has so many brilliant ideas and just didn't have either the time or the budget to fully to fully shine with that. And also the hardware limitations. I mean, that game pushes the PlayStation One very very hard. Like the the models are all wobbling. <laughs> um. So, and I think when you're going through the the kind of sewers and alleys of Le Mans or Le Mans, it's um, it feels like a Souls game. If you know, it feels kind of like a Kingsfield in a way. And so, it's um, I think that would be really fascinating to to see what could happen with that. Okay, Peter. Yeah, yeah. that sounds amazing. I'd play that in a heartbeat. Okay, so Peter, Peter or Alana, um, who's next? I'm still thinking, like, I don't really hypothesize about stuff like this. I mean, I mean, I'm simple, right? I just want a damn port of Skies of Arcadia. That's all I want. (laughs) But, um, I suppose I would really love a prequel to Shadow Hearts made by all of the members of Sacknoth who were originally with Kadelka. And the original trilogy, I think I may have even given this answer to a previous question on a previous podcast, <laughs> but to follow Yuri Huger's father through his own journey would be really great. And that's probably the only answer I can give because I just, I just kind of like being surprised by stuff. Like if a nice, if a good game gets a sequel, it's surprising. And if a game gets a spin off and I'm interested in it, it's great. But 
I also don't want a sequel to Skies of Arcadia because that game is, like, inaccessible as hell, and I want everybody to play the original before, like, the remote, or, like a remake or a sequel or a prequel, so... Skies of, Ar- yeah. Skies Sorry, of Arcadia I- will come <laughs> up later in this podcast, I promise, because I, cause, cause I've read all the emails ahead of time. <sighs> Um, yeah. but, 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 uh, Peter, do you have an idea for a, for your dream game in this, in this, uh, prompt? Yeah. I mean, I have a lot, of, I have a lot of ports and stuff that I, I think, um, I would like, like, I mean, I really want Lost Odyssey to escape Microsoft's clutches, even though mm-hmm. I know that will never happen. Um, but, uh, my main thing is I really want that sequel to Final Fantasy Type Zero, um, mm. They tease that at the end of the game, and um, I mean, it, I've 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 sort of outed myself on the past as being the uh, the resident Final Fantasy fifteen uh, apologist. Um, oh, you mean RPG fans I, game of the year twenty sixteen? Yeah, because it was good. <laughs> it was fine. Yeah, it was a good mm. game. I mean, it was whatever, all right. I whatever, completely whatever, whatever, whatever. twenty sixteen yeah. was a pretty thin year. Besides that, yeah, <laughs> In I, whatever, fairness. man. I, I, but I think Tabata's games all have really interesting themes um, to them, um, and maybe just were slightly lacking in execution for platform reasons. Like Type Zero is constrained by being on a PSP game that was later ported. Um, Fifteen has had this super tumultuous development cycle and shipped piecemeal. Um, I would really like to see, and and then, and then he like literally left the company before Project Athea got announced, and mm-hmm. we don't know what's going on there yet. Um, but I would really like to see more of the world of Orients. I thought that setting was fascinating. I thought the music of Type Zero was really great. I, the like it's just it's a it was a really neat idea for a game that's kind of constrained by being like one of the last PSP RPGs. And I would love to see that that more fully realized. So, all right. So, Mike's third question: uh, Your personal favorite game, or you've played, or best experience for Retro Encounter? Um, I, let me go. I want to hear from you guys first. I'll go last. Uh, does anyone have want to volunteer? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, uh, I'm actually going to go with the uh, the Superstar Saga podcast we just did. Um, I really enjoyed playing that game again, and it was fun hearing everybody's. Uh, everybody's opinions on the game after all this time i think for me i mean it's like a most predictable answer ever um but um near automata i mean like it was just great to i mean even though i played it for like the third time like in a very short period of time um just like the conversations that we had around them i felt like were um were good and there was some disagreement on some on some elements that i thought led to some good discussions um in terms of like my favorite experience on retro i mean i don't know probably losing on the trivia podcast twice was pretty fun too <laughs> I'd probably have to say, I'd probably say Nier Automata too. I mean, it just had, um, I really loved, I really loved the discussions that we had on that game and on Mother 3. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they were just, I, I think that those were really rich conversations that um, I felt I got a lot out of by discussing it on this podcast. Yeah, Mother 3 is one of mine as well, um, just because... I don't know, it felt like a very open discussion and like Joe said, we all learnt a little bit and all had a really productive chat about Mother 3 and all of its themes. Uh, my other pick for game is Suikoden 2 because I go back and listen to those episodes pretty frequently because I remember them so fondly because they were so funny to record. Like, we just had such a blast chatting about those ga- that game and it was such a great panel and it was just really fun. But in terms of experience, you know, winning a quiz show episode is also pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my answer is uh, I, I immediately thought about Suikoden End Two. Uh, that was a game I had that had, was sort of absent from my uh, uh, resume for a long time, and I'm glad I finally crossed it off and had a absolutely amazing time playing it and discussing with it, and 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 sorry, and discussing it with. Uh, a few others, but uh, for a more recency bias influenced one, I-, I would think maybe Yakuza Zero, because that game really, like I expected it to be a lot, and it was still more than that. And um, <laughs> I have never thought more about a game's like group of middle-aged Japanese male villains that f- for that game that I have for anything else. Four lieutenants, baby. Yeah, it was uh, um, the Tojo Clan is in crisis. So yeah, my answer is Yakuza Zero. I still think about that game and think about revisiting the Yakuza series uh, over the past couple of months, and I think I, I will do that later this year. Probably try uh, Kiwami or Kiwami Two. 
So uh, thank you to Mike Wooten for three very thoughtful questions and something like 25 game suggestions. Uh, he went above and beyond in his email to us. So uh, next we have this email from Ben M. Uh, Zach, can you read it from Ben M.? Sure. Uh, so um, Ben uh, congratulates us on episode 250 um, and says that they have a question for us to consider. Often we consider some of the greatest games as those which are part of a larger series. For example, the original game and sequels are those which are part of a larger franchise like Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. If we don't talk as much about the one-shot wonders, what are some of your favorite games which are single entries and people don't talk about much but are worthy of holding their own against the giants in the video game pantheon? I look forward to your continued video game potting success. So thanks, Ben. I already know Alana's answer. Yeah, it was also my answer. <laughs> I mean, like, Skies of Arcadia is the perfect answer to this. Pretty much, yeah. I do have other answers, though, so just I, I, I thought you'd call me out mm-hmm. for this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, if you want me to get them, Please. yeah. So uh, another one that Peter um, mentioned earlier, Lost Odyssey. I think Lost Odyssey oh, yeah. is the main Final Fantasy XIII. Um, I think it's great. Um, I I remember something you were talking about, or it was Caitlin on the Near Automata podcast, and how affected she was by text on a screen. Lost Odyssey was my first ever experience of that. Like the small narrative short stories that played out and you just read them are so good. Like, I yeah. love them to bits, and Other. I think, yeah, and I think it being stuck on the Xbox 360 does it a little bit of a disservice. Like, it's not perfect, but I do think it's genuinely really good. And my other game that I came up with, um, everybody praises Secret of Mana as being great, and Secret of Mana is good, but it's aged poorly, and this may have aged a little poorly as well, but I think people write off Secret of Evermore a little bit too easily, <laughs> and I think it's a weird, fun game that I had a lot of fun with as a kid, and... I wish I still had a Super Nintendo to play it. It on is again. weird and fun, so, and, I, and I don't think there's really another way to play that game. Uh, it's definitely it's definitely not yeah. available digitally anywhere, to my knowledge. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think it like could stand up to any of the giants, but I certainly think it's left out of the discussion when people talk about Super Nintendo action RPGs. And I think, in some ways, it's aged better than Secret of Mana because I mean, Secret of Mana is busted, and you know those uh, percentage hits are annoying as hell, but. I think Evermore's got some other problems, but I just think it's a really cool idea and a cool setting and a cool world that people are just like, oh, it's just the American mana game that's not officially mana. And it's like, yeah, but it's original and it's got some really fun ideas. So, yeah, I like that. I guess that's not really a standalone game, but it's not really an official. No, it's well, yeah. no, it's a standalone game. It's yeah. it's not in the it's not in the mana universe. It just no. is, it, they just use some mana engine technology and making it. And and, and I, I wasn't kidding. My my real an- my original answer is Skies of Arcadia. But yeah. my uh, weird second answer is Jean Dark for the PSP. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. that's a great answer. Yeah. That was a really really fun strategy RPG that did a lot of that had. Uh, some historical fiction elements, some magical girl anime elements, and some really ni- neat ideas like super moves that allow you to take extra turns um, if you uh, finish off an enemy. So, like, the, a lot of the strategy is having m- your main units sort of soften enemies and then have one of your transforming units uh, do their super move and, and, like, take out eight at once. It was a really satisfying uh, twist on strategy RPGs. And I'm I'm a little... A little miffed that uh, Level 5 never uh, revisited that. They just It was just a, a one-hit wonder. Level 5 seemed to have a habit of having a couple of games in a series and then going off to do something very different. So you can never say like any of their stuff is too similar. But and now they're on kind of yokai now, aren't they? So it feels a little bit like we're never going to get any of those cool Jean Darks or Dark Clouds or stuff. And like even Nino Kuni, yeah, it's all right. But... It, yeah, Nino Kuni ran itself into the ground yeah. fast. I, I, they made like a zillion Layton games and a right. zillion Inazuma, Inazuma Eleven games, but I think <laughs> they may have abandoned both of them for Yokai Watch as well. Yeah, I would say I would say for mine, the world ends with you. You know, it's getting it is getting an anime series um, next year, but in terms of just a one off game, I think. It's one of my favorites. Um, I think it's spectacular. I love... um, I think the battle system is so unique and one of the most thematically rich um, battle systems that I've ever seen, just in terms of how it plays into Neku's story and the experience you have with the actual 
Council. You know, that's a game that really, I that I think only truly shines if you're playing it on a DS or 3DS. You know, there's the Switch port and there's iPhone or iOS and Android, but you, those dual screens really change the way you look at the battle system and you look at Neku's relationship to others. And I think the story itself is genuinely pretty great as well. Um, so I really love that game. Really love it as a one-shot. Don't need a sequel to it, um, but I'm sure as heck going to watch the anime. <laughs> yeah, there still, you go. Yeah, I still need to play it. Same. I, oh, I tried so playing it on, I tried playing it on DS and had a hard time getting into it. I have the Switch version, which I know is kind of the lesser port, but it looks sharp, and that way I can sort of have a, a facsimile of the experience. But I played it for this podcast in I think 2016, yeah. And uh, it, yeah, that was just a, a a duo Josh and I episode, and um, it was and I'm I'm not the biggest Nomura guy, so at times it was it was I struggled to you know enjoy what was happening around me in that game. But it, it does go some really interesting places and has really cool ideas. It like it once you get into it, uh, it's easy to you know like um hack through it to the end but it's a it, it's it's a weird one but a cool weird one yeah for sure um if i if i had to pick one standalone game for this it would probably be residents of fate um that game was a, it was a tri-ace rpg on the playstation 3 that later got um an, a, a remastered port um which i appreciate because that game was underrated and needed more love um, it came out kind of right around the same time as Final Fantasy XIII. I think it got overshadowed. But um, it's a really unique, really difficult steampunk RPG with really challenging gun, gun combat. Um, really, yeah, I, I've heard about the shooting in this game before. Yeah, it's like it's 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 not really a shoot an action combat system, but you still have to be aware of your surroundings. Enemies will move, and you have to like. It's all about positioning, planning, and timing, and um, it's a lot to keep track of, but it's really rewarding once you figure it out. Um, and I also, it's also one of the few tri games where I just actually, I think the story is actually really interesting. Um, <laughs> that, that, that sounds that sounds cattier than I meant it to. Um, they're, they're, the characters in this are very anime-y, but they're also surprisingly just a little more down-to-earth. The game uses a lot more muted color palettes and... Um, and and just in general has kind of a more somber tone than Trias's other stuff. And they even got Nolan North to voice uh, one of the main characters, which is kind of surprising for a JRPG. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, Residents of Fate's uh, Res- Residents of Fate is a really unique game. If you're looking for a game that has really technical combat and just a very unique setting and really good music, um, then yeah, you, you should give it a try. You know, this is one that I struggled with, um, even look, looking at lists as we're talking, trying to come up with one that I think is, like, like worthy of, like, coming up. And I, I, I can think of some that I like that I think are going to have sequels, like Octopath Traveler. Um, <laughs> so I don't think that really qualifies. Um, Xenogears only kind of qualifies. I mean, like, there's only one of them, and we would have liked more. Um, so I guess Xenogears is my answer, uh, for obvious reasons, because uh, we got, like, episode five of six, or, like, uh, one episode of, like, six of them, and I think that, that would have been great to sort of see it fully fleshed out. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys um, talked about a lot of the ones that I would have thought of, so yeah, I think there's um, not as many as I thought there would be. Yeah, I think we often think of video games as franchises or series before individuals. Mm-hmm. Like, like... uh uh, I mean, a lot of people say I'm a Final Fantasy fan instead of an I'm a Final Fantasy IX fan. It's it j- just it's just the nature of the industry, I think, because success usually breeds more pressure to make a sequel. Mm-hmm. But yeah. anyway, th- uh, thank you. Oh, wait, do, do we have any more that want to do one? No, sorry. No, I think oh, we hit it. Okay, all right, cool, cool. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next email. Uh, Joe, how about you read this email from Pear? Certainly. So from Pear, it says, Hey y'all, love the podcast. I fell into the site when I was looking for more gems to add to my collection. As a big game collector, I love listening to you guys talk about lots and lots of the games I love. And I will say, I was torn when you had the PS1 battle it out with the SNES. I'm also partial to the PS2. Growing up with, the Se- growing up with Sega, I must also say that Sega being dumped out was sad for me. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure Perry is referring to the uh, um, best console for RPGs tournament that we held earlier in the summer, and I'm also a little sad about the result of that one. But it was a really inter- it was really entertaining to record. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was tough to listen to. I was like, oh no. Um, <laughs> he says for some game wrecks, he says Treasure of the Rudus is a good one, uh, Dirt Languisher, Treasure Hunter G, and Front Mission as well as the Atelier games, and lots and lots more never released outside of Japan. And he ends the email by saying, I want to tell you guys I love the podcast. Hope you read my mail and keep doing what you do. You guys make my boring commute to work so much better. Keep it all up. Pair the hillbilly gamer from Norway. Thanks, Pear. Yeah, Pear, uh, I think about half of the games he suggested were Japan only, which is... Not a problem, because we have done an episode, episodes on Mother 3, which has been Japan only for many years, and Terranigma, which was uh, Japan and Europe mm-hmm. only for many years. I, I think Treasure of the Rudra has actually just got a fan translation, um, uh, if I recall correctly, because it was one of those games where the, the isn't the, that the one with the weird magic system that's based on, like, pictographs? Yeah, it's like it's it's like pictographs and keywords that you chain together. Yeah, which proved to be a really uh, difficult would be yeah really difficult to localize, which I think is why we never got it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think some dedicated fans finally um, uh, finished a fan translation last year, or the year before. There there was an almost complete fan translation several years ago, but I think this new one like. Uh, basically changed systems. They basically did a more of a full localization than just a fan translation to make the to make things like the weird ma- magic system fit better. I do remember reading about that, but I, I didn't go uh, deep into researching it. But those are all pretty interesting ones. I mean, the only, I mean, I've played one Atelier game, but other than that, I haven't really finished any of the uh, uh, ones that Pear mentioned in his email. No, I've, same here. Yeah, me either. I've just I've just listened to a lot of the uh, Atelier Risa uh, sound Risa Risa soundtrack, um, <laughs> which is fabulous. It's really good, and so mm-hmm. I'd be mm-hmm. so that definitely endeared me to giving that game a shot at some point. Yeah, definitely. I've played some Atelier games. I've played Iris, um, the oh, the tri- the trio that came after the Iris trio, um, which were all on PS3. And then uh, I tried Esker and Logie, and that's where I fell off. And then I, oh no, it was one of the Dust games, and that's where I fell off. And that's where Derek was pretty much falling off I, as well. I, I remember when Derek was reviewing that game, and he was just <laughs> sending, he was sending clips and being like, "This is hell. This is my hell now." Yeah, yeah. I would definitely recommend some of the original. I, well, they're not original because there are some Japan only ones that are on PS One. Um, mm-hmm. Or even like Manakema, maybe like the ones that are set in the school would be really cool. But um, the Iris trilogy uh, have got a much more distinct balance between the alchemy side and the turn-based story RPGs. So I would be up for giving the other two a go, or even replaying Iris because I haven't played uh, Eternal Mana, the first one, for right. That's that's the one I played. Fifteen years, I want to say. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, late-ish PS2, I think. Um, I, I got it a, a couple of years after it came out. All those other, all those more recent Atelier games have gotten tons of ports. Um, I think they yeah. ported all of them to the Switch recently, even. So you can get a lot of the PS3 ones are also on Vita. Yeah, yeah so the accessibility is definitely not an issue here. All right. Well, thank you, Pear, for that email. Uh, Peter, how about you read this email from Raul? All right. Yeah. So from Raul, we have. Hi, Mike. Here's a question for the mailbag episode. What minigame or side activity in an RPG have you spent way too much time on? For me, it would oh, probably be Triple so easy for me. Oh. <laughs> What's oh, baby. Oh, baby. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Peter, Peter, read the rest of the email, yeah. but I, I have some words for this. <laughs> we, so do I. So do I. Um, as a future game for the podcast, I would like to suggest Radiant Historia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my favorite RPGs for the DS. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts of the game's combat system, writing, and excellent soundtrack. Looking forward to episode 250, Raul. Raul, I see you are a man of culture as well. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Another fine Story is a magnificent game, and I would love to do a podcast on it. It would have been a good suggestion for one of the one-off games, too. I didn't even think about it. Oh, shoot. I should have thought of that. 
It got, I, I shot, it got, it got I, a remake, but we don't talk about that. Yeah, I was oh, going to yeah, say, I feel yeah. like the remake soured a few people on it because of what it changed, but I yeah. hear the original is really good and I own it. Um, it's one of the last games I remember that didn't get a European release on the DS, so oh, really? I'm always a little bit sour about that. We got the 3DS version, but not the DS one, but I it was. I think it was a pretty late and coming DS game. Yeah, I, it was at the very yeah. end of DS's life. So I had a hard time mm. finding it when it came out. And Atlas Games we didn't get many of them towards on the like on the DS. We got Shin Megami Tensei Four, and it was digital only. And I don't even think we got some of the Devil Survivor games. One of the ones that mm. like came. So yeah, Atlas just didn't have a publishing um, branch out here, so we didn't get a lot of their stuff. Yeah, but now, but now uh, Atlas's publishing branch has Sega money, so we're getting all the Yakuza, all yeah. the Shin Megami Tensei. Oh boy, um, and and. and, and Possibly remakes and ports coming as well. Uh, like, I think the Persona 4 Golden PC port was a surprise to everyone yeah. when that happened. So oh, when I, the, I think I, I, think I, we'll, we'll, I uh, audibly mm. squeed when the uh, the Nocturne HD announcement happened. If they yeah. do Digital oh, Devil Saga, yeah. I'm gonna freak. <laughs> oh god, I, think, I, I would love a combined DDS one and two uh, oh, future port. Mm, yes. But back to Raul's original question: What mini game or side activity in an RPG have you spent way much too time on? Uh, for me, I have two answers. Uh, it was well, no, three answers. Uh, uh, triple Triad, but in FF14 and not FF8, because I have played so much Triple Triad just waiting for dungeon cues to finish that I I have, like, oh, jeez, I have something like uh, 210 out of the 280 cards that are that exist. Wow. Uh, like, a, a lot of That's them. That's amazing. I, I, even got a, I even got a 1% Bahamut drop from, a, from an NPC. Yeah. What is with your luck percentage? I couldn't, be, I couldn't believe it. I, I could not believe that one. Um, it, it, I, I, I do have video game drop luck. I don't. I don't. I can't explain it. I have not done anything to deserve it, even a little he's, bit. He's the, <laughs> he's the Jaden. He's the Jaden Yuki of video game loot drops. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But so that's my first answer. My second answer is fishing in every single RPG because I love fishing. Oh. It is. It is the perfect thing to wow. do while you have a podcast on. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I do all the fishing in cold st- in Trails games, all the fishing in Persona games, all the fishing in East games. Uh, in East 8, every time you catch a fish, you give it to a big shoe bill that hangs out you at do. your town. And, and I'm, I'm like, well, this is the best. I lo- like, the best characters in East 8 are the giant monkey martial arts monkey and the giant fishing shoe bill. Yep. Um, oh, and Donna. She's cool. But, yep. uh, my, but third... Um, We've talked about this a lot, uh, n- not on the podcast, mostly separately. But I, it's Blitzball. <laughs> I I played about sixty games of Bit Blitzball uh, when we did that podcast many years ago. I got Waka's uh, sigil for his weapon. Mm-hmm. It was great. I love Blitzball. Yeah, I mean, I yep. my my answer is probably the same. I mean, like I have jumped in a no- I, I I'll even get the sigil and then I'll keep playing. Like, eh, yeah, I guess it's enjoyable. Like, I'd rather do this than just keep going with the, with the story. Um, I think my real answer probably though is Chocobo breeding in Final Fantasy VII, not because I enjoyed it, but because I am the opposite of Mike in terms of drop luck, and I could not <laughs> could not for the life of me get the Chocobos to breed the way I needed them to, which is like a weird way of phrasing of something but um <laughs> yeah you, you need a wonderful yellow and then a black that's great or higher I yeah think. yeah i had horrible luck with it something um like i think it took me like i'm not kidding like 12 uh-huh. 14 hours of just straight doing it over and over and over again to get it right it was just before like people knew how to manipulate rng like they do now but um that's probably my real answer <laughs> yeah. for not fun reasons <laughs> i'll join the blitz bull thing i love blitz yes. i've also continued to play it after getting the sigil and i love building teams in that game so it's great when uh, are they killing the beasts forever right i know it would be so good in 14 i feel like that would be the one <laughs> i would probably resub really quickly if they did that um mm-hmm. i my other two answers i love the cooking mini game in swigger than two which shouldn't surprise anybody as someone who likes cooking um and I also, any RPG that has a casino or gambling, I will spend hours and hours, even if there's no mm-hmm. rewards. Like, I just love having all the money. Like, it's great. It's a power trip. So, And unlike in real life, you can save scum in case you get a really bad roll. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've definitely, Tales of Asperia, I've definitely spent more than 10 hours playing poker. Like, I, no, I sp- no joke. <laughs> I spent so much time on the slot machines in Dragon Quest Eleven. <laughs> yeah, me too. No, Dragon Quest Eight Roulette is my jam. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, 
I probably I probably spent a, a inordinate amount of time playing the Crimson versus card game in Dot Hack GU. Um, what's oh, weird? God. Has anyone else played this? No, but I know of the card game. Yeah, so like, what was actually really interesting about this card game is that it is almost a hundred percent a meta game. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't actually play the game, but what you do is you build a deck. You put you upload your deck to their fake digi- their fake server, and while you're playing the ref- the normal game, it runs in the background playing against random opponents. And when you come back, you see how well your deck did. Um, and the meta game changes, so you have to adjust your build to best combat what the most popular cards are. Um, it's really interesting, and for someone who like me who's really into collectible uh, TCGs. Um, it was just, it was, I honestly probably had more fun playing Crimson Versus than I actually did playing Dot Hack GU at that point. Um, <laughs> um, I also, this, the, the, my other, my other one, I don't know if this really counts as a, as a mini game, but I'm going to put it as a side activity. Um, shiny hunting and Pokemon games. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> if you have the patience to run in circles hatching eggs, um, the dopamine rush when uh, you, will you get a slightly different colored Pokemon is just really, really exciting. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It is fun. I have a shiny Charizard and it makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, well, I... Um... I wouldn't really regard it as, as like a side quest. If if we did regard like hatching eggs and Pokemon as a side quest, I have I have lost years of my life um, when I <laughs> when I used to do tournaments more. Uh, just just I have aged five years because of trying to get a gosh darn uh, gibble that was good for a battle. Um, oh oh my god! I have I have at one point I had one hundred and thirty. Anyway, um, so whoa. Um, so my answers would be more recently Cabaret Club Czar in Yakuza Zero. Yes, of course. Oh, oh my god! Yeah, r- so r- real much estate, real Yakuza estate. Zero. Yeah, real estate so, and cabaret in Yakuza and um, darts. I played a lot of Yakuza darts. <laughs> that and in my in my younger years, a lot of contests in Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Oh god, yes, Love they were those. so good. Yes. Oh yeah, and you and you do the um you do the berry mixer. Um, yeah, I was, do. Oh my god! Oh, oh yeah, I had so much fun with that. Yeah, so much time spent getting a really good Milotic. Yes, exactly. Because you need to max out that beauty stat. Mm-hmm. That's right. I am surprised nobody said that one mini game in Final Fantasy VII remake, <laughs> 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 what everybody loves. Darts. Not darts. No, I'm being sarcastic. It did not Uh-oh. come out very well. Oh, do you, are you, do you mean pull-ups? I do. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got, those, I got um, those trophies, dang it. Yeah, I mean, I got it, but it definitely, uh, my, my hand hurt a lot when I was done. <laughs> my hand I, uh, I, I, gave, I gave up after a certain point. I've, we were all talking in the chat, and Zach was like, it took me over an hour, my hand hurts, and I'm like, I, I, don't, have, I don't have Zach's hand strength, I don't think. I'm just going to give this up. <laughs> Yeah, for a second I thought you were talking about um, uh, the the dance at the at the Honey Bee Inn, and I'm like, well, wait a second, you can't replay that. I tried oh, to man. replay if that. You could, <laughs> I, I would have. Impressed. Yeah, I would. I would. I, I would say right before it. If they made Final Fantasy VII Dancing All Night, I would buy it like right now. Yeah, oh, wait, weird. This is this is accidentally a reunion of that spoiler cast that we did in April and oh, May. Yeah. It is. Oh yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey everybody. Hey. <laughs> F- yeah. Fancy meeting you around here. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, uh, do, do, does anyone else have a mini game to talk about? Uh, remember Chompcraft from Bravely Second, Mike? Oh, I do. I never finished. <laughs> I never finished Bravely Second, but I still had forty hours on that cart because I was just playing Chompcraft. I God, it, it basically, it's, it's people like uh, like assembling toys in like a factory line while you uh, strategically boost them by pressing the eat a snack button, and uh, snack it, it's a button. It, yeah, it, yep. it, it's it's pretty mind. Yeah, the power up to give everyone more energy is a snack button, but it, it's it's pretty mindless. But it is a good way of earning a lot of money in that game. Uh, so I, I definitely indulge that in a little bit. I really like Bravely, Bravely Second. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you, Raul, for that email. Our next email comes from Aiden. Uh, Alana, can you read that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, Aiden. Um, he says, I am only a recent convert, convert to the podcast, finding it about a month back, but I've enjoyed listening to some, ugh, some of the back catalogue episodes and the recent Tactics Ogre discussion. My only quibble on that one 
and you're responsible for this, not me, um, was that the levelling up system you described doesn't tally at all with my recollection of the game, having only played it around six months back. I, yeah, th- 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 that's because the levelling is very different between the PS1 and PSP version. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I, I think all of us are playing it on PSP. Yeah. Um, I suspect it was improved for the PSP release, and certainly it worked differently on the PlayStation version. Which class you were affected, which stats increased and level up, and there were limitations on which class you could switch to. This may have affected your enjoyment of the game, as I certainly rated it much higher than you guys did. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> oh, uh, well, um, possibly yes. Uh, I, I think that if I had more time, I would have enjoyed the game more. I, it, I was slightly crunched to play it for the podcast, so I, I didn't explore the full story of it. But but I, I came I came out of it on a uh, positively still. Yeah, I, I, mean, I didn't li- hate it. Listening mm-hmm. to you guys, you all talk about it. It just sounded like it was like proto Final Fantasy Tactics, and like if you'd maybe played it first, you might have had a different opinion of it. But well, that's like a really reductive way of boiling it down. But that just was the impression I got anyway. Um, but to continue Aiden's email, um, having listened to the Tactics Ogre and Console Tournament episodes close together, a notable omission from the list of PlayStation 1 RPG games came to mind, which would be my suggestion for a review or game journal episode, and that's Vandal Hearts. Um, it's another strategy RPG um, in the same vein as Tactics Ogre and Final Fantasy Tactics. However, some of the complexity is stripped away, which isn't always a bad thing. In terms of the gameplay, the music, and story, I think it's a very memorable game, and it should definitely be on your list. Keep up the good work and you are from england as well so thanks aiden much further north than i am but always nice to hear Hmm. from people in the same country as me thanks aiden um is there a way to play uh, vandal hearts outside of the original ps1 copy i could have sworn it was on the playstation network but i'm looking it up now and all i'm seeing is the sequel no one likes oh so hmm, i don't know it's, I, I, I know it's it's one of those games. I know it has a really hardcore fan base. People really like it. Oh god, it's 185 bucks on Amazon. Oh, oh yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. I, I think um, I, I have heard a lot of Vandal Hearts discussion on things like uh, video game forums in the 2000s, like RPG fans. But uh, <laughs> but we have uh, those again. yeah, but I. I, I know very little about it other than that, like, uh, I think enemies scream and explode in blood like a, like a 1970s, um, samurai movie when they, when they die, uh, which is may, maybe an exaggerated memory. I, I haven't actually played the game, but, uh, but yeah, it is early strategy RPG for the PlayStation that does have its fans. Yeah. If there was a, if there was an easier way to play it, like that would definitely be an interesting one. Cause I think it's one of those, like kind of hidden hidden gem type games that people have a lot of fond memories of yeah we've got fans of it on staff definitely right and i think someone has it on our big google doc in the sky for suggested games uh i have to check the list to see if that's true but uh but yeah vandal hearts thank you for the suggestion aiden um our next email comes from Bridget. uh one of our friends from the from RPG Fan former staff, uh, Bridget and I both joined the RPG Fan music staff at the same time in 2014, and uh, she and I still message each other to this day. She, uh, Bridget is a delight. Follow her on Twitter. And Bridget, that maniac, sent us eight questions. <laughs> so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna read all eight. We, you don't have to respond to all eight. Let's let's each. Pick one to respond to, okay? <laughs> oh, I already had at least two responses, though. <laughs> uh, uh, no, 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 well, we'll um, we can mess around a little bit, but we don't need to each give a detailed response to all eight, because then this podcast would uh, be on the road to three hours, and we don't want that. Okay, so uh, Bridget writes, Hello, my friends. Here are some topics you may enjoy. Topic number one, cute boys. To- topic number two, ships. And I think she means relationships and not, like, boats. Topic number three, best looking food or food you want to eat from video games. Question number four, what the hell happened to Dark Cloud 2? I don't know. I missed that thing. Uh, Topic number five, uh, I guess you could talk about best cats because you already talked about dogs, um, which is, well, Bridget, we already did talk about cats. (laughs) Uh, Topic number six, we didn't do this. Uh, Best frogs in video games. There's only one Um, answer for that, so... I got. I, I thought of two, but yeah. we could. Uh, I know the worst uh, frogs in video games. Oh God. We do. 
Huh. Seism- Seismitoad from Pokemon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. true. No. Oh, this, yeah. This, this, the, the side quest in 15 where you have to hunt for, like, frogs that oh, are, like, two pixels. They're, like, two pixels in a <sighs> meticulously detailed stream, and you have to be oh, in exactly no. the right spot to pick them up. Final Fantasy 15, game of the year 2016. Anyway, mm. what? <laughs> uh, topic number seven. Uh, she got into an argument whether Kingdom Hearts is an RPG or not because you can just spam X in fights and that's what RPGs are about, so I'm very confused. Do not be confused, Bridget. Your friend is wrong. Uh, topic number eight. <laughs> Which video game world would you like to live in solely based on the food available in the game? That's her second food topic. Bridget was probably hungry when she wrote this email. <laughs> I think now so. I am. Um, <laughs> Bridget, don't podcast when you're hungry. <laughs> Uh, but have a good day to everyone, especially Alana and Sakowski. Thank you for spelling my name <laughs> completely wrong. Only the S and the O's and the I were correct in that spelling of my name. Beautiful. So, uh, panelists, which of Rigid's topics should we should we address? I'm going to go with best frogs. And actually, I mean, there's an obvious answer for this, and the answer is frog. But I think the save frogs in Mother 3 are just delightful. Um, and so yeah. that is my answer to this question. My answer would be, of course, Frog from Chrono Trigger, and also Jean from Breath of Fire Two. Oh yeah, uh, also oh, a good no. because it's a uh, you meet him as he's a giant frog in a pond, and he's like, "Please, I've been transformed. I'm a prince. Save me!" And when you finally turn him back into a prince, he's still a frog. <laughs> he's just a human sized frog. <laughs> you don't, you don't joke. like touch me from Final Fantasy Seven. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Um, I, I think a better Final Fantasy frog than the FF15 or FF7 frogs are the FF9 frogs that uh, Kina eats. Yeah, those, those are pretty also, good frogs. Um, also, the um, Regent Sid turns into a frog, doesn't he? That's He's right. an oglock mm-hmm. and then a frog. The FF14 giant frogs creep me out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Poro Rogo. There, there's a miniature FF14 frog called Poro Rogo. Who's a oh, yeah. little frog with a ma- with a mage hat that you fight in a, a pretty good dungeon called the Anti Tower? Never mind, I take it back. Frogs are good now. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great dungeon. Yeah, it is. That's good. good. Yeah. Uh, so, cute, cute boys. The entire cast mm, of fifteen is great, but that, I, would, <laughs> I would really love to cuddle Noctis. Um, mm, they're not cute. Um, best looking food and world that you want to live in based on food. Also, Final Fantasy fifteen because I just want you, Ignis, to cook for me. I would say any Vanillaware game for food. Oh, man. That's true. Any of them. Especially Muramasa, I think. But all of them. I don't know what it... I haven't I haven't seen if there's any cooking or food in uh, 13 Sentinels, which is a real video game that's coming out in a month after this podcast goes live. So, yeah. <laughs> do you remember, do you remember, you remember the E3 where it was just a card... It was on the badge, and then all they had was a cardboard <laughs> stand out of a robot. Yeah, that was... And we still had was, no I, idea. I, I think that was 2017, so it took them three years from like making it a prominent part of Atlas's marketing to actually have the game come out in the United States. It's, it's, it's wild. Uh, man, remember, my RPG, oh. thir- remember when we all thought 13 Sentinels was Death Stranding? <laughs> no, actually. I thought, I, thought, I thought 13 Sentinels might have been Frog Fractions 3. Also a great video game frog. Excellent video game frog, Frog Fractions. Um, but uh, sh- Ships, Machias, and Usus. No oh, yeah. ships at all, and Dogi. Yep, that one too. I'm not. I used to be into shipping as a teenager, but I'm not anymore, really. So, a, yeah. As a teenager on GameFAQs Fire Emblem forums, I got real deep into shipping for Fire Emblem Six, Seven, Eight, the the, the GBA ones, and I have very strong <laughs> opinions on. On who Lynn is possibly the mother of in oh. Fire Emblem Six. Unfor- un- unfortunately, all of my shipping wars have devolved into I just want everyone to be Polly. So <laughs> unfortunately, it's just I just ship the protagonist with everybody. Well, if I got a game for you, it's called Trails yeah. of Cold Steel. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing it right. I'm playing it right now, and I just want Reen to be with everybody except his sister. For God's sake. <laughs> well, in, in Trails of Cold Steel two, the game absolutely supports that, except for the not being with his sister part. I um, hate everything. I'd also prefer to be didn't date his teacher. You know, personally, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> or his students, yeah. or his or his teacher's policewoman friend. It's like, like really. <laughs> I just want to slap Cold Steel sometimes. So hard. I, I'm, enjo- I'm enjoying it a lot, but it definitely falls into some anime tropes that I'm not fully comfortable with. Having played Sky after Cold Steel, I now understand why everybody says that Cold Steel is like a big step down. Like, I really do. It's really... They're still great, but 
I can I was, see how it's devolved, yeah. And I was squicked out by Sky a little bit, as you can find out in, in the very first episodes of Retro Encounter. Oh, um, right. Yeah. But, oh, um, quick going back, going back to food and frogs, I just remembered that Monster Hunter is a thing. But Monster Hunter has amazing looking food, especially oh, Monster yeah. Hunter World. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's a frog monster in several Monster Hunter games, but not in World, called Tetsukabra, who's a giant armor frog who's a very good boy. <laughs> but not, but not a cute boy. Uh, Monster Hunter World also has some of the best cats in video games. Great yep. video game cats in Monster Hunter World. Uh, well, in, in the whole Monster Hunter series, really. I think I think Palicos go back to MH1. So let's see. Uh, do y'all, uh, what else do we have to um, pick around in Bridget's submissions I mean, here? For cute boys, uh, Vothri from Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> oh uh, n- no! Mm-mm. There are so many. There are so many actually cute boys in Final Fantasy XIV, and you landed on the least cute boy. Yeah, you know. Come on, when Orshafont and Estinian and Ar- oh, yeah. Ardbert are around, why did you land on Valthry? Why? I mean, we, we like what we like. I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> oh, speaking of Final Fantasy cute boys, how about the Imperial Norg? Am I right? <laughs> hey. Not again. Obviously. Obviously, Norg is... Not again, please. (laughs) Norg is (laughs) god-tier. See, you may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. Oh, Oh, boy. Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) Okay, if we're devolving into some lower-class memes, I think... Um, uh, Kingdom Hearts is an RPG because you level up, your friend is wrong. And also, it can give way harder than this. You play, you play, you play the role of Sora. <laughs> okay, so let's I'm please sorry, stop I'm... talking about Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy fifteen and move on. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. All right, uh, Joe. Can you read this email from Joshua? Of course. I promised Mike I would send some ch- suggestions, so here we go. I'll try to keep it somewhat brief. So uh, Joshua recommends. Ogre Battle 64, parentheses, anything you can give me. Any of the Eves games, uh, Harvest Moon slash Story of Seasons, um, Threads of Fate, Soma Bringer, Castlevania, uh, Symphony of the Night, Aria of Sorrow, or the like, uh, Lost Kingdoms, and not being sure if this is quite in our coverage, but Marvelous, another treasure island. Uh, and says, thanks for all your hard work. Joshua from Zelda Universe. Yeah. All right. So going down the list, uh, Ogre Battle 64, that, that is on our list of possible future episodes. And our website's Pete Levitt wrote a very detailed Ogre Battle 64 feature um, mm-hmm. a month or two ago. That's, mm-hmm. that's definitely worth a read. Uh, I support more ease on the podcast. Absolutely. We did Oath and Felgana last year. Harvest Moon Story of Seasons. I mentioned my lack of experience with farming games. Uh, the, the, podcast, the podcast encouraging me to play one would be a good place to start. Uh, Threads of Fate was one of those weird square games from the Summer of RPG in 2000. And that one, uh, and that one is on PSN, so it's actually it is, fairly yes. available. Yeah, I think it's um, it's definitely either six or ten bucks, so it's a uh, definitely accessible. It looks like, I don't know, it, it looks like if um, Vagrant Story was made by the Mega Man Legends team, kind of. But it's a, uh, but it, it definitely has its fans. Yeah, it's cute. Uh, uh, Soma Bringer, I know nothing about, but Castlevania, I know about the Soma in that game. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Aria of Sorrow, Dawn of Sorrow. I, I definitely put. We have played Symphony of the Night for the podcast, but I played more Castlevania. So, Soma Bringer was that was that unlocalized um, Monolith Soft game for the DS, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah, I believe Mitsuda scored it, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's, yeah. I know it has its devoted fans, but it never got an English release. I remember this is the one that I used to mix up with uh, Sands of Destruction a lot. That's it. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's really cool because it. I, I I wish it would have been localized because it has a lot of the same team that worked on like say Xeno Gears because there's a lot yep. of you know there's Takahashi in there and uh, I think Sarai Saga wrote it too so like yeah um, Masato Kato wrote Sands of Destruction which is why I mix up Soma Bringer right. and and oh, Sands gotcha. of Destruction a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah that, that that speaking of games that will likely not appear on this podcast Sands of Destruction that was a thing no uh, no no, no one suggesting that absolutely uh, that was one of my bigger disappointments of around that time of playing RPGs yeah it definitely was Lost Kingdoms is interesting though there, there were two of those games right yeah I think they might one of them's definitely GameCube only and hasn't come off that system I think I think that was uh, two. I want to yeah, say. Yeah, they might, they might have both been GameCube only then, yeah. I mean, I still have my GameCube. But... 
Hmm, card RPGs on the GameCube. You don't say. Mm. This, this does appeal to my sensibilities, um, that's for sure. How have you not played Baton Kytos, then? <laughs> I, I, I can't afford it. That's true, it is <laughs> really can't... expensive. I have the first one, but not the second one. I, I And Baton Kytos is something that we've that's been suggested for the uh, podcast before. That might have been in... Uh, in Mike Wooten's giant list of games. It was. There we go. So yeah, Baton Kaitos is on the list below. But uh, but was not one of Josh's suggestions. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Josh, for sending us this list. Uh, Josh and I interact on Twitter a lot. He works for uh, Zelda Universe, which is a very well-trafficked Zelda fan site. Um, and we ran into some Zelda Universe people at E3 last year, didn't we? Yeah, we I think did. he was yeah. one of them. Is that, is that yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if Josh was there, but it, it was, there was like a whole table of Zelda universe. I was like, "Hey, RPG fan!" That was yeah, they were super that, that was a surprising yeah. moment. Yeah, I was. I think I was hungry, so I was probably a little bit. And I was waiting in line for a, a, a box lunch, so I was probably a little short with them. <laughs> I'm. So, I'm sorry, Zelda universe. That's, that that it was. Me, it's me, not you. <laughs> yeah, we. I think we follow each other on Twitter too. He's a really nice guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So thank you for the email, Josh. Uh, Peter, can you read this email from Chris? All right, yeah, sure, from Chris. Hey, guys, I've been interested in playing the Dot .hack games recently, starting with Infection, and I thought it would be cool to see you guys talk about those a bit. The lore and story behind Dot .hack is really interesting, and coming off Yakuza, which is a series that builds on its characters and story with every inter- iteration, I think it could fit a bit. If Dot .hack really isn't your jam, I've been interested in the way of the Samurai games or Xenosaga. Tyler is very excited right now. Um, I do have a question as well. Is in the way that the Die Hack games are direct sequels to each other and continue the story from where they left off? I was wondering if you know any other JRPG series that did this as well. Um, what I know of is Xenosaga, FF10 through FF12, Shadow Hearts, and Kingdom Hearts. I really enjoy the idea of a series that builds an epic story over the course of a couple games. Keep up the great work, Chris. Chris, thank you so much for reaching out to us. It's a very interesting question and some great recommendations. Um, I'm and gonna, cr- before any if, sorry, go on. Before anyone says anything else, the answer to Chris's question is trails. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kaseki, yeah. Kaseki, Kaseki absolutely is a great, um, great yeah. choice for that. Um, it, it, trails is on game number ten now, coming out in Japan very soon, or, or maybe may already out by the time that this podcast is coming out. But uh, all of those games build up build upon their predecessors in a way that's frankly daunting. Official mm-hmm. release of Crossbell when. I know we'll get them eventually. I think I'm sure. I'm sure we will. But I'm, I, I don't know if I, I trust that. I, I think I'm probably just going to watch a walkthrough before I um before I jump into the future games. I have plenty of games that are available that I haven't played yet before I can even think of cross spells. So I'm uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm good for now. And hopefully in 2022 when I'm ready to play it, it'll be out. This is how hype. This is how hyper fixations work, my friend. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, Dot Hack is real. Actually, a really fascinating series, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the last Recode ser- uh, HD collection combined the GU trilogy into one release and also included a bunch of the special features. That is readily available, and I think that would actually be a very interesting podcast game because uh, yeah, the Dot Hack games were really kind of ahead of their time in a lot of ways. Um. Um and uh. Well, I, I don't know if um, we probably could do know. all three installments, but we could. But Rebirth could be a very easy podcast game to do. Yeah, I, I heard Rebirth or, or Infection would be the one to play for the podcast. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, the um, the um, I, I am OQ games. The first four are probably a little beyond us right now. Although I actually did see a copy of Quarantine at a local game store the other day. I didn't buy it because it was still like one hundred thirty dollars, but. Like, oh, the, the, oh, that's easy. I'll just, I'll just, I, I, I'll just skip over to, I'll skip over to Michigan and then pick it up there before someone takes it. Right. I did, I did, um, but I did see one in the wild. They do still exist. Um, but um, the GU games are a lot more, are a lot more readily available thanks to the HD port. And um, one mini series of game that, games that we've talked about on the podcast a little bit that I love dearly is uh, Shin Megami Tensei Digital Devil Saga. Yeah. Uh, D- DDS 1 and 2 are direct sequels that are very, very connected, and they're awesome. I, I love DDS 1. I've played it one and a half times. You can chronicle that half time on the podcast from a few years ago. Uh, and I, I've started DDS 2, but it, it's pretty challenging in the early going, So I uh, and, and I kind of wanted to replay DDS 1 to get a better save file to port over to 2, so I sort of abandoned yeah. that playthrough. But I, I, w- I would like to finish DDS 2 eventually, because... DDS1 is awesome, and DDS2 starts to answer the many, many questions raised by DDS1. So that, that's that's a, what I would call an example, a good example of a strong sequel. This is this is this is a slightly less um, uh, 
less continuity driven answer, but um, near Automata um, coming off of the original game, you don't need to have played the original near. But if you do, there are so many references, and um, it'll make the some of the scenes with Debola and Popola so much more resonant. Mm-hmm. It's true. I mean, I think that Persona um, 2, I suppose, also works for this. Uh, oh, yeah. Su- Suikoden yeah. kind of works. I mean, like especially Suikoden 1 and 2, they feel like definitely direct sequels to each other. They take place very close to each other on the continent, share a lot of characters, um, even though they're not as directly on from one another um, as... Um, you know, as the series goes. But, I mean, I think those are two good options as well. Anyone else have ideas for connected sequels, or should we move on? We can edit. We can, we're going to edit this out. No. Uh, Danganronpa? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not RPGs, are they? I guess. Yeah. And they're like... They, yeah, they, fall, within cover- they fall within coverage. <laughs> they do? Yeah, no, no, I no. Guess I so. know. Yeah. Um, but and Danganronpa, like... you, could, you could also say that about Zero Escape then as well, I suppose. Yeah, yeah Danganronpa and Zero Escape both are... Um, series that uh, um, they're all one big interconnected story and they really award reward your engagement. So, yeah. If you want to go like to six emails ago and talk about great standalone games, I love AI The Somnium Files. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. still need to play that, man. I'm oh, that, game, that game's great. <laughs> that game's amazing. great. Uh, we, uh, we've been streaming it recently, uh, Scott, Leona, and Steph together, um, which has uh, been very entertaining to follow. Yeah. Uh, well, but, all I love right. Uchikoshi. Yeah, uh, let's move on to the next email. Uh, Zach, can you read this one from Coriander? Uh, so, uh, Coriander says, Play Final Fantasy X-2 for the podcast. Because it's the first Final Fantasy game I played start to finish. It was subjectively great without the Final Fantasy X baggage annoying me because I've never played X. And here's their question. That is a, t- that is a take. Hold up. Hold up. He <laughs> played is, FF2 and not, and not FF10. Take. It sure is. That is, <laughs> that is fascinating to me. <laughs> And I and I apologize. I said Coriander. It might be Coriandre. I'm not. I'm not sure how to pronounce this name that I've only seen via email. Coriandre, email us again and tell us how to pronounce your name. <laughs> yes, but uh, anyway, um, continue. Um... Uh, continue with uh, Corey's email. <laughs> so uh, this person's first question is: What's the best sequel you played but never played the previous game? Sort of following on from their. Um, story and their second question is and this is a good one how do you all have time to podcast work do things on twitch the site and be on discord oh. <laughs> i don't <laughs> yeah, I, is, say, I don't have much I of a do life not. <laughs> um yeah the yeah. answer is uh my sleep and relationships suffer <laughs> and also i'm not on twitch <laughs> i i, I can't, yep. honestly honestly Corey, if you're looking for like time management skills you've come to the wrong place my solution is that i have a mental breakdown every so often and have to disappear for a few days um and i don't recommend that <laughs> it's not fun. yeah my my mental breakdowns are just uh bouts of unproductivity and depression where people in the rpg fan staff have to talk me out of not quitting the podcast <laughs> I mean, uh, it's yeah, I've learned over time that, like, to get a good balance, like, do enough that you're satisfied or mm. try not to put pressure on yourself, I think, is the main thing. Like, I don't I don't stream on Twitch and I don't think most of us do anyway. And I'm not a big part of the Discord. Like, I tend to respond to DMs, but that's about it. Um, yeah. I've not been on podcasts for a while and that's kind of how I wean off. I love being on them and want to be on them all the time. But also, I just... You know, I have friends. I know it's, you know, given the situation at the moment, not as often. I have games I want to play. I have family. I have things I want to do. So Mm. it's just, just take care of yourself is the main thing I would say. Like, it's not about balancing every, it is about balancing everything, but it's just about putting yourself first. And if you know you're at your limit, then you just have to drop one thing and just be like, okay, that's fine. I'll step away. But most of the time, I'm really rubbish at managing my time. So yeah, I'm not the best person to ask. You know, for me, the best sequel I played but never played the previous game, I'm actually not sure that I have any answers to this anymore. Like, that I would, the answer would have been until very recently, uh, near Automata. Um, but like, I'm sort of like a weird person. Like, I've been playing RPGs for so long that in general, like, if I played the second one, I've also played the first one first. Um, like, that's true with Suikoden. Like, a lot of people haven't played the first one. That's true with Lufia. A lot of people haven't played the first one. Um, so I'm sort of unique on that. But, you know, my answer would have been near Automata, but now I think that, um, I'm sort of um, probably unique in that that basically doesn't happen for me anymore. <laughs> Does do the pers- do, do, do personas three through five? Oh count? yeah, that's that's one. I've played four and five. Oh yeah, sure. No, yeah. One's, well, I'm, no I'm, one's no one's played Persona one because I, I I've played Persona one, which is why I know I di- I dislike Persona one. <laughs> <laughs> It was a really bold decision of them to start the series with two. Oh, 
Some people like Persona 1. Persona 1 is best experienced as a Wikipedia entry. Fine. Or if, if you can get Fenner to play it for you. Hi, Fenner. I know Actually, you know, having a 15-minute <laughs> conversation with Robert Fenner is probably better than the Wikipedia entry. That's what I recommend. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, no, I'm in the same position of Zach. I have probably played, if I play a sequel, I've likely played the original. Um, I don't like leaving things and stories unfinished. So, like, the sequels I haven't played. Like, I haven't played Suicide in 3, 4, and 5, and I haven't... Ooh, what else have I not played? Uh, well, I'm in the middle of playing Persona 2, so I'm sort of semi-going back, but I'm not quite ready to go back to 1 yet. Um, but... Yeah, I have played a bit of Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne. I haven't beaten it, and I haven't played any other Shin Megami Tensei game, so I guess that's my answer, really. But yeah, I, I, I don't like to leave series unfinished, I suppose, or at least skip ahead if there's some kind of continuity. I like to try and start at a decent starting point. Jo- Joe, did you want to get in there? I, I don't really... I don't really have one. I can't think of one. I... Even when I was younger, I tended to start from the beginning of a series, so I can't really think of I can't really think of any off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I don't have much for that, but I also second that we should play FF ten uh, ten two. So, <laughs> um, oh, and how do we all the time to podcast blah blah, blah do all the sorts of things? Uh, I tend to start my days the same way. I. I'm an early riser um, and kind of have a very uh, strict schedule, which is not uh, the best thing at all times. It helps keep you on track, but it also makes you a bit inflexible. So I'd say like keeping a consistent schedule if you can, um, but not becoming so rigidly inflexible that it is uh, that it's, it is harmful. Yeah. 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 I second that. I will say, I will say, dude, going all the way back to his game recommendation, A Ten Two is a really good game. I quite like it, even as a sequel um, to one of my favorite Final Fantasies. I think it works pretty well. Um, uh, yeah, so I would play it again in a heartbeat. I never finished FF Ten Two and wouldn't mind revisiting it. It has really great menus. It has good menus. <laughs> has an excellent job system. It has the mm. best turn-based combat in the Final Fantasy series, probably. Ooh. Um, and I, I find the end game a slog. That is the only yeah. thing I really do not love about Ten Two, And do not do Last Mission or that extra dungeon. They are a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. they are real. They're, that's really tough. I mean, if, if you're like a completionist, that game is a completionist dream, but also a nightmare. Oh, it's awful to complete. To get all of the dress spheres and the grids is really hard, and you really need to and um, you really need to use a walkthrough. Um, also, thinking about mini games, I hate that breaker mini game in that game. What's it called? Um, sphere break. Sphere breaker. I hated it. It's yeah, such a pain. It, it's terrible. Mm. Um, Maybe we should save this for the podcast. If it when we inevitably, when we, yeah, we'll, 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 we should get to it. I think that'd be a good game journal. Rather. Yeah, sure. It, 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 it can go on the list certainly. But uh, thank you, um, Corey, Coriant, Coriander, Coriandre. I apologize for not knowing how to pronounce your name, but thank you for the for the email and those two great questions. Uh, Alana, can you read this email from Brent? Yeah, sure. Um, so, hello, Retro Staff. I'm a long-time listener of the show, and I've enjoyed it immensely over the years. I enjoy the episodes about random topics concerning older games. Topics that I would like to hear the panel discuss, so we'll answer these questions here, I suppose, uh, would be what JRPGs would you revive, What favorite? what's your favorite game in a series, and what makes an RPG so good? Um, games I would love you all to play, Kingdom Hearts 2, <laughs> Final Fantasy yes. 9, Breath yes. of Fire 3, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance 1 or A2. And thank you for the wonderful episodes over the years, and here's to another 250. Oh, thanks, Brent. And this is some big hmm, questions uh, in like a short span. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> right? Yeah, let's. I, I'm gonna um, abridge his questions a little bit. Um, what, what JRPG would we revive? Sure. Uh, favorite game in a series? We've had a couple episodes like that. We've done um, the. Uh, which Dragon Quest is Dragon Best and favorite Tales, favorite Final Fantasy, uh, ep- favorite Zelda episodes that are kind of those, w- w- which basically evolve into series discussions that has us land on a fa- on a winning or favorite game at the end. Uh, so I-, I wouldn't mind doing those for more series. Uh, 
we, we've, we've talked about that a little bit, but um, we, we could do more of those. And what makes an RPG so good? I mean, that's that's almost the core of several of our podcast episodes. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's celebrating what we like and dislike about specific games, and, and generally more positive than negative. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Brent, continue listening to Retro Encounter is, is the best advice I have for you there. But let's talk about what RPG JRPs would we revive. Um, we touched upon this on a little bit in other questions. Uh, Zach, you can't say have Mariyama bring back Suikoden <laughs> again. <laughs> I could talk about my other my pet thumb, series. Right? I mean, like, I, it, it, I don't think it's possible now, but like another Lunar uh, would be like a, a true Lunar oh, three. Yeah. Uh, like the creator is, is dead at this point, and like that studio is gone. But like a true Lunar three, yeah. oh my, um, that I would go yeah, wild. The, for that, that studio, ga- yeah. that studio, Game Arts had. Uh, had siblings working together, and one of the siblings... I think one sibling was the CEO, and one sibling was the lead writer. And that writer uh, within Game Arts wrote Lunar 1 and 2, then Grandia 1 and 2, and then I think Grandia 3 was partially done when he died, or something like that. And he died young. He was in his 40s. pretty young. Which is is really too bad, because, man, reviving Lunar, that that might be my answer. Because Lunar 1 and 2 are awesome. I really, really want Mistwalker to make something again. Like, yeah. They're in is, mobile games now, though, aren't they, really? I think they're making something for Apple Arcade right now, right? Yeah. And they're doing yeah. that Apple Arcade thing. Um, but tons of their mobile games, like Terra Wars, Terra Battle, all shut down, like, almost immediately. Um, which which is funny because it leaves, like, one of the biggest pieces of cross-promotion they had is a fully voiced, fully rendered side quest they added to FF15 with the main character from Terra Wars, a mobile game that existed for a week. Um <laughs> Well, like, well, but and, it, and it, but it's just one of those things. I would love to see them return to full fledged console development. Um, we've talked about Lost Odyssey already, but like a sequel or a new IP, or just, I don't know, just something. I I, I miss those guys. Uh, something has also popped up in this episode a couple times. Breath of Fire is a series that I really really like. I think it has really uh, quirky and interesting character designs and. Uh, and sort of b- gameplay ideas. And I-, I would like to have a proper console Breath of Fire 7 and not the mobile at Breath of Fire 6 that we ended up getting. They could just call yeah. it Breath of Fire. They could just call it Breath of Fire 6 and pretend that never happened. Yeah, you just call it Breath of Fire and then colon something because Capcom is doing so well right now. They are they have several hits in a row. I- or at least personally I, f- I feel that way. <laughs> so uh um, because I because I adored uh, Monster Hunter World, Mega Man Eleven, uh, Street Fighter Five is a good fighting game. People to stop stop uh, stop hating on it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I I would love Capcom to continue their hot streak with uh, with reviving Breath of Fire in a satisfying way. Yeah, it's not like they don't know they exist because they stuck all the soundtracks on Steam a few months ago. So. Hmm. Um, I'd say. Um... Final Fantasy Tactics Advance 1 and 2, um, both games that I'm interested in playing, especially with Advance 1, um, that's the first appearance of the judges, which would, you know, later show up mm-hmm. in Final Fantasy 12. Um, and they're kind of, they're, they seem to be an interesting system. I've never played Advance 1 or 2. Um, I really like Tactics, as a lot of people know now. I really like Matsuno games. So I would definitely be interested in that. Um, don't really have anything that that I can think of off the top of my head to revive, other than as I already brought up, Vagrant Story. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't really have an answer for that either. I mean, there was nothing like Wild Arms, and I've never played a Wild Arms game, so that would be a cool series to bring mm. back. And I know you played three, um, and I know there were mixed opinions on. Wild Arms 3, but I do feel like there's nothing quite like a Western RPG set in space, is there? So I'd like another one of those in some... I, this is weird. I've played about 75% of both Wild Arms 1 and 3. <laughs> um, <laughs> and both of them are really good, but they do sort of devolve into a slog slash grind. Uh, bo- yeah. Both of them hit slow points that I think make them a little hard to finish, but have really cool characters and ideas and and uh and and motifs like I, I i would totally welcome either a revival of wild arms or another western uh sci-fi rpg absolutely yeah i mean i guess my real answer would be shadow hearts again but yeah 
All right. Well, thank you, Brent, for that email. Uh, our next email comes from Sam. And uh, Peter, how about you read this one? All right. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, from Sam, we have, hello, friends. Firstly, congrats on getting to 250. Wanted to hear your opinions on cutest and worst mascot characters in RPGs. My favorite would have to be Mishy from Legend of Heroes. And although I've never finished Xenogears, I have a pretty soft spot for Chushu. Her growing to the size of the gears was pretty badass. On the other side of the scale has to be Teddy from Persona 4. I know people hate on Morgana, but at least he's a cat. Cheers, Sam. Okay, Sam, I'm not calling you out or anything. I appreciate your fan mail, but people who don't like Teddy are cowards. <laughs> no, I can't stand Teddy. Is Teddy is so I annoying. He's like a latch. I think we're gonna he's the fight. worst character. Yeah. We're going to fight. Worst. He's the worst character in Persona 4. He's so irritating. He okay, just okay, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I think his, I think his Teddy, personality is Teddy, grotesque. <laughs> Teddy, Teddy, yeah. can, Teddy cannot be the worst character in a game where Yosuke exists. Yosuke well, is also actually, bad. Hey, Teddy and Yosuke have a team up attack together. So the so the solution is to use neither of them. So you yeah. so you can always get guaranteed a team up attack. Correct. Yeah. Look, I just I just appreciate the word glomp being in an RPG from 2008. <laughs> okay, don't you? Yeah. yeah, that is a phase of life I'm glad I've left behind. <laughs> oh, it, it ne- you've never you know ne- it never leaves. It's all. <laughs> oh, I assure okay. you, it's gone. <laughs> Teddy, <laughs> Teddy is the 2008 anime convention of Persona 4 characters. Glad we oh. straightened we can, that we out. We can all spend an extra hour in the ball pit. Anyway, My, um, I like Teddy. Morgana. I like Morgana. I like Morgana. So I forget I like. Yeah, I agree. Teddy and Morgana, both voiced by One Piece voice actors, so they both get a pass from <laughs> yeah. me. I, uh, mm-hmm. um, but I also I also appreciate Choo Choo and the scene where Choo Choo is crucified. <laughs> That's the one thing I remember <laughs> oh about Choo Choo. <laughs> Xeno Gears, Xeno Gears is wild, man. <laughs> I love Xenogears I, so much. I, yeah, I, I only played about 10 hours of Xeno Gears. I've been thinking about um, you know starting another play of it. Um, on, yeah, because it, yes. it seems it seems sure. pretty wild, and I also like that Choo Choo is the name of kind of the mascot character from um, Revolutionary Girl Utena. Oh, um, yeah. So hmm. it, it it's kind of funny because they both came out within about a year of each other. Because I think Utena was ninety seven. Yeah. Um. So it so I guess Choo Choo is just a popular mascot name at that point. <laughs> and Choo Choo Rocket on the Sega Dreamcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have no it's idea a, what that is. <laughs> it's a cute little puzzle game. It's actually really fun. Ooh. I think I have the... There was... Yeah. Um, Sorry. Um, well, okay. I mean, chew is the Japanese sound for a squeak or a kiss. So a lot yeah. of mice-themed oh. things are called chews or choo-choos. Like, even, like, bomb chews from Zelda are called oh. for that ways. And mm-hmm. when I think of mascots, uh, maybe this is surprising or maybe it isn't. Um, I, I think of the Tales games consistently having a mascot yeah. character. So... Uh, I, I like Mew from Tales of the Abyss. Uh, if Rapide counts, then he's the best one. Yep. Um, but he if, if he's okay, he's an RPG dog, but also a mascot. And in that, in that case, like Rapide and Koromaru uh, are are one A and one B for uh, RPG anime mascots. Heck yeah, yeah. I think Tales is really hit and miss. I I don't mind Mew. I know the fan base don't like him as much as others. I like Noish, and I also like. Uh, Rolo from Exilia 2, which is the really chubby cat that you send out to go and find other cats. I think that's a really fun side quest. Um, oh, shoot. Who's, um... Oh, who is it from Tales of Eternia? Uh, uh Quickie. Yeah, Quickie, the flying Quickie's squirrel. Great. Quickie, Quickie's great. I like Quickie, yeah. Quickie's Quickie great. Quickie might be better than Mew for me, I think, now. Yeah, it's Rapide, then Quickie. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. but my answer is from a series I've never played before and something that comes up quite regularly is a yoga from the little hamster from the Shining series. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's <laughs> a good choice. Um, in terms of what... Oh, no, and also Mr. Saturn from Mother mm-hmm. Earthbound. Sure. <laughs> Um, but worst, I think it's Teddy. I really, really, <laughs> really do not like Teddy at all. And yeah, I, it's a big reason why I look back on Persona 4 and I'm like, why, why did I love it so much? Like, mm. I'm telling you, the key is keep Yosuke and Teddy out of your party. <laughs> yeah, but they still talk all true. the time. <laughs> and that's true. Exactly. I think my answer I mean, for my- worst would have to be Nopons from Xeno. I mean, like from the Xeno series. Like they're really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're super annoying. <laughs> I mean, like well, even Rick- Ricky. Ricky, Ricky, Ricky is is the best of the of a bad. I coach. agree with you, Peter. Yeah, uh, I think Ricky okay. is cute ish. Um, but still grates on me, but like, uh, <laughs> in Xenoblade, uh, X, oh man. Um, oh, Tatsu. Yeah, I couldn't remember the name, Tatsu. 
And I think they're all annoying in in, in two. Oh, the, the I, I can't even remember his character name in two. I, I I just completely blocked out his whole like I have a robot made, and I'm like, good, I'm going to delete you from my memory the minute I beat yep. the game, and I've done exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get far enough in Xenoblade 2 oh, to man. meet him. I can't even think of the name. I still, got, I still got to try that game again. I can't think of the name. It's going to drive me crazy. Oh, one that I really liked about 10 years ago until it was done to death was Claptrap from Borderlands. Oh, like, right. Oh, first, yeah. like first, first Borderlands game, and even a bit of the second one, too. It was like, heck yeah, Claptrap. Pretty funny. And then just like... They just, quadrupled down on him. The, the, yeah. The, like, we, we, there was some Claptrap overexposure in... Yeah, I mean, in in between the pre sequel and Borderlands three, I'm not a Borderlands player, and I I think we've gotten too much claptrap. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, it, claptrap went from like, oh, this is cool, this this is a good mascot to like, uh, Gur levels or minion yeah. levels of oversaturation in within that series. Um, and I haven't like I was much more into Borderlands one and two than I was then. You know, I haven't played much of. Um, pre sequel or uh, three, um, just because also some of the humor and the and Brandy Pitchford and and just some of the gearbox stuff just really grates on me. Um, yeah, can be kind of mean spirited as well. Um, but Claptrap back in you know late two thousands, early twenty tens, sweet mascot, pretty cool. Yeah, Claptrap kind of suffers from the Jack Sparrow problem where it's just like. Yeah, this was really cool and fun once. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, before we move on from Sam's email, I would be remiss not to mention uh, Dragon Quest Slimes and uh, SMT Persona Jack Frost, two to, uh, mascots, I more generic mascots in, in, in terms of them. Yeah, in terms of being um, not specific characters mm-hmm. that I really, really like. Although my official answer is Koromaro and Repeed. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I have, uh, I have a th- shout out to Pikachu, too. Pikachu, oh, Pikachu, of course, Pikachu's sure. Yeah, the mm-hmm. iconic. It's kind. Of, is it kind of overdone? Is it my favorite Pokemon? No. Is it adorable and popular for a reason? Yes. <laughs> and and when they did had to make two versions of the Yellow remake for Switch, I think Eevee was a good second choice because it's a yeah. it, it's a level of popularity and iconography that I think is is good for Pokemon. Like yeah, like of, of course people will still will buy an Eevee game. Of course they will. Yeah, I, I, you tell me I can pet my Eevee and dress it up in little hats. You better believe I'm going to do that. <laughs> and teach it like seven really powerful moves instead of having it evolve. I'm like, sure, all right. Um, anyway, thank you, Sam, for that mascot themed email. Uh, we have only two emails to go, so uh, Joe, let's have you read this email from Matt K. All right, uh, dear Mike and Company. First, many thanks for the years of content. I've been listening since episode one under Josh Curry, and it's been so great to hear people so passionate about RPGs. First RPG was Dragon Quest One, aka Dragon Warrior, and growing up I always had trouble finding anyone else who enjoyed these games as much as I do. I've really enjoyed commentary, game selections, special episodes, quizzes. I think my favorite episode was on Tetris. Also, <laughs> like a certain someone in the group, I've never quite understood why Kingdom Hearts is so popular. Mm-hmm. Sorry, not sorry, Peter. I'm I sure accept you... your non-apology. <laughs> I'm sure I endorse a... your non-apology. I'm sure you've got a great backlog on games to cover. Have you considered an episode dedicated to speedrunning RPGs? I love seeing videos of people destroying what I thought was difficult as a kid or exposing a glitch in the game, such as Earthbound Skip Sandwich Skip. Uh, I would love to hear a Bahamut Lagoon or a Treasure of the Rudris episode, but I know they are essentially nowhere to be found. Thanks again. Uh, I'm with Stupai? Stupe. It's a, Stupe. It's, it's a Persona 4 joke. Oh, no, it's a I don't know. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Y- Yukari calls Junpei Stupe in Persona 3. I'm just, ugh, I'm not. Gotcha. Speaking of um, things, speaking of things that haven't aged well. Uh, mm. Listener Matt. Oh, oh, that's well, a sweet, that's sweet. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. I think speedrunning, an episode on speedrunning would be really interesting. And earlier this year, I really got into watching like old reruns of Games Done Quick. Um, the obvious answer is Castlevania. I love Castlevania speedruns so much. It's so good to watch them be broken. Um, and sometimes I do just put some of the longer ones on in the background. Like, they always do, like, a big Final Fantasy run. Like, I think Final Fantasy IX was last year. And a speedrun for that game is eight or nine hours. Um, it's, so it's always really interesting to see how they manipulate stuff. So it would be something I would be willing to do. I'd need to do a lot of research. And 
I'm going to throw out a fun fact here, and it's another Bat and Kaios fact. Um, there is a speedrun for that game where you have to 100% it, and the world record for it is something like 347 hours or something <laughs> like that. Jeez. Um, I, I hope they tag-teamed that and not a single person doing it. Uh, so there's a system in that game, and if we ever cover it, I'd like to go into it. Um, items age over time, and there is one particular item that takes two weeks to age fully and turn into something different and that's why it takes 300 hours plus oh god <laughs> so they just leave the gamecube on basically wow interesting so yeah i'd love to do an episode on speed running rpgs actually i can't do it but it'd be fun to discuss some yeah. of the techniques no i can't do it either but it's fascinating like i love i love i love watching them so yeah that'd be definitely be something In- I, I did the. Uh, this is not. This not. This does not count as a speed run. But I did do a run of FF9 where I got the Excalibur two, yes, which is uh, which is basically you have to get to a point in the final dungeon within twelve hours, and that's how I learned about things like how powerful uh, Limit Globe is, and mm-hmm. uh, and and stutter stepping through dungeons because I think like uh, so just so you don't have. Uh, random battles back to back each other there's something in the game that says you have to take at least two steps before a random battle happens so if you learn to like do one step pause one step pause one step pause you can get through entire dungeons with no random battles um and so learning those things about uh ff9 in doing a quasi speed run of my own uh gave me a a new appreciation or at least a different appreciation of the game so speed running let's people's minds go real strange interesting places it, it might be worthwhile to do an episode on it I'll, I'll i'll add that to the big ideas board i think i will do that right now in fact octopus speed runs are cool as well because they tend to do just single character runs like tressa runs are like 50 minutes <laughs> oh, that's wild so fun as an this is our second uh call for treasure of the rudras too <laughs> true yeah. yeah didn't expect to Two for a uh, for treasure of the Rudras, but <laughs> cool. That's I rad. think this is I think this is multiples for Bahamut Lagoon as well, which is a very uh, weird but good strategy RPG that Square made for the Super Famicom. But I'm sorry, Alana, it has squares. I know. I'm getting over it though. It also has it also has amazing <laughs> dragon sprite work, which ooh, mm-hmm. I love it. Um, fun fact about Bahamut Lagoon: I'm pretty sure that game's working title when they were developing it was actually Final Fantasy Tactics. Wouldn't surprise me. I remember hearing. I don't know if that's true. I remember hearing that story somewhere. But um, I just think that's kind of fascinating. That game does some things with visuals and especially lighting that I just never really have seen on the SNES slash Famicom. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's really it has some really interesting visual tricks. Um, yeah, cool game though. It seems. All right, so thank you, Matt, for uh, for that discussion and especially for being a listener since episode one. That is. That is crazy to me that someone has been listening since May of 2015 or soon after that. Uh, because, yeah, oof, this podcast is about five and a half years old. That's a little wild to me. Pretty crazy. It's been a long road. We, we have one final email, and this is from another very dedicated listener from Jed. Uh, Jed has even sent me uh, a, a, a gift in the regular mail uh, earlier this year. A, a, a stained glass uh, rec- recreation of a of a Dragon Quest character, which That's is so cool. really beautiful. It, it's it's hanging in my uh, in my game room, and in my and uh, I I appreciate it every day that I look at it. So uh, and you can find that uh, that on my Twitter feed from several months ago uh, if you if you care to see what it is. Uh, thank you, Jed, for that, and thank you for your email. Jed sent us four questions. So I'm gonna we're gonna do what we did for other multiple question emails. Read all four of them and then uh, and then sort of tackle them willy nilly one by one. Okay. Uh, so Jed's email. Uh, hey everyone, as always, love the podcast, the trivia show, and the Battle of the Consoles episodes are my jam. I have lots of questions, so uh, uh, no offense if I if most or all don't make it on the air. Well, guess what, Jed? I'm reading all four. Um, Jed writes, as a member of the queer community, one of the most endearing aspects of RPG Fan and its staff are how inclusive the site and Retro Encounter are. Keeping in mind that we have a lot to do to dismantle systemic racism uh, and homophobia, do you feel that RPGs naturally encourage a sense of inclusivity in its players? Question two. As a kid, and even now as a 35-year-old, I love to make up RPG stories in my spare time to amuse myself. I would create characters, battle systems, maps, plots. Have you, any of you created an RPG in your head? If, you, if so, could you share any details? 
Uh, question three, are there any games you'd love to do on Retro Encounter, but, log- but logistically are not feasible? Question four, this episode's panel is now a JRPG party. What class or job are each of us? Are you a balanced party? Is it a three-character system? Who's on the bench? Uh, <laughs> what, what are your classes if you were a JRPG party? And uh, Jed ends the email saying his retro game suggestion is Shining Force 2. So thank you, Jed. Where should we start here? Uh, Joe, I'm going to call you out a little bit. You hosted an episode of Random Encounter, uh, I think over a month ago by now, that was um, focusing on LGBT issues and representation in RPG in RPGs, and uh, on the panel also included um, LGBT staff with, from within RPG Fan, which included Alana. So, uh, what are your reactions here? Do we do you feel that RPGs are naturally in- inclusive? Hmm, are they naturally inclusive? I. I don't think that, um, I think that on the whole art is inclusive and can be accessible. That's kind of how I feel about it. Do I feel that way about RPGs and the RPG landscape? I feel that they're more inclusive than other game genres, I suppose. Um, I feel that there are some genres and some communities that are better at this than others, um, I think that generally the RPG community is more um, is more you know is more inclusive of uh, queer folks than let's say um, Counter Strike community or something like you know it's like like just or the Rainbow Six community God um, <laughs> but it's um, but of course there's a lot of work to be done with that and I don't think that. Um, and for a various number of reasons, I don't think they're um, as inclusive as it comes to dismantling systemic racism as, say, the fighting game community. I think the fighting game community is uh, quite a bit better about this. And yeah. The fighting the game reasons... community would not exist without large participation from people of color. It's, uh, I, I, I really feel strongly about that. About that. Absolutely. Um, mm. And so it's just... And, I think the the reasons why that is they're myriad and it's and there's a lot of debate to that, but um, I think that there can be uh, there is a great space for inclusivity in RPGs. Um, we're getting there in some aspects, and I am feeling positively about some of that. Um, but in other respects, I think we have a lot of work to be done. You know, what I think is interesting is that I think RPGs themselves could be, I mean, because you're, like, you're talking about parties of characters, you're talking about people coming together, and I think that they would naturally lend themselves to more inclusivity. But uh, that's really all, all comes down to the developers. Um, and I think that oftentimes the developers, I mean, we're talking about things like Persona, they do a pretty bad job of it. I mean, like lots of, lots of um, I think JRPGs in particular do a really poor job of it. So I think that it could naturally lend itself to it, but it generally doesn't. Yeah, I feel I'm kind of in the middle of both of you there. Like, I'm feeling good about some stuff, but I would say that, you know, you've got a party of people who are joined together to save the world, and there are certain games that do tackle racism, although it does come across, especially with JRPGs, and I'm thinking of the Tales series, it's like baby's first lesson on (laughs) racism and things like that. And I'm like, Uh "Mm," and I look back at those experiences, (laughs) and I'm like, yeah, you taught me that, but mm, you're so close, but not quite. Mm. Um, And I think... (laughs) Persona is a great example because it tries to push these kind of themes of individuality and you can express yourself and, oh, you know, screw the adults. But then it really, the themes are there, but the message it gives are not right. Like, they're not all the way there. And I'm consistently frustrated that it all boils down to stereotypes or, you know, like offensive, offensive stereotypes in particular. And Mm -hmm. even in the community, like... I think we are a lot better than we used to be. And I said on the episode that I do feel like I surround myself with good people. You know, RPG Fan is a fantastic place because everybody is so inclusive and so grateful for us being here. It's wonderful. And you go online and you see like one thing like, oh, I don't want to pick my pronouns or I don't want to pick, I don't want to date the same gender or like someone with the same gender identity as my character. And it's like, 
you don't have to, but why are you complaining about it? You don't have to play it that way. Just play it however you want. And it's annoying because it's like a kind of erasure. Like people mm-hmm. just want to, they want everything to fit one template and that's it. And then they're like, well, you go and make your own game it's if you want what you want. And it's like, Yeet. no, like people Yeet. should be, we should be allowed to enter the space to make what we want. Yes. But people should also consult with us to see what we want. And you know, RPGs should be inclusive, like Zach was saying, you know, like it's people getting together and save the world. But then after the game ends, it's like, oh, there's still work to be done and stuff and there's still horrible things happening. And then there are like, you know, sexist characters and, you know, oh, the gay panic and stuff like that. And I'm just, yes, they are in ways like I love watching a group of people get together who are all different, change the way they think save the world, overcome adversity. Great. Wonderful. But there's always those undertones and the messages that they're delivering and that they're mixed in that, yes, you want to save the world and do all the things and you accept everybody for who they are in your friendship group. But the minute somebody you don't like is something, you know, like, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but like the minute someone who opposes your ideology is like queer or the opposite gender, then there's like immediate jokes to their expense and whatever they are. So I've I've been thinking about this question a lot, and I don't really have the easiest answer in the world. Um, but no, I think you yeah. said it really well, Alana. It's something I feel pretty strongly about, and like the everyone should go and listen to the random episode because it is a really fantastic discussion, and I'm sure all of us have tons more to say on the topic. But yeah, like it's it's just such a loaded question, and I wish they yeah. were better. And I think there are some things they are good at, but ultimately, I feel like there's a lot of work to be done. And in particular persona which is like yeah let's be individuals and then it just fails completely you know and it, it's funny that you mentioned that because like i remember um, i was going to mention persona as well i remember when persona 4 first came out um in 2008 roughly um and people were giving it a lot of praise for mm-hmm. being progressive and inc- because for paying lip service to these themes nowadays we look back at it and now that more queer voices are being added to that conversation you hear a lot more of the criticism, the flip side. Oh yeah, maybe now now Toe's character arc and the way they pr- handle her, uh, her uh, their gender identity is not as progressive as we once thought it was. Um, and I think there needs to be, I, 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 I while the effort to include more progressive themes is always appreciated, there needs to be more. Um, there, people need to be more willing to criticize the work that does come out and engage with those themes. Right. Yeah. Um, and interestingly like i said on that episode persona 4 is the game i essentially came out with like came out after playing because of kanji but something i maybe didn't say on the episode is i kind of look back on that and i'm like damn it took you that poor representation for you to come out like i'm not ashamed of that but like i wish i'd been given something better to realize i suppose and and that's just one of those that's just one of those things where it's just like there is you know, I don't think I, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a cis hat white dude. I don't have like, I don't have the experiences that you guys have had with, with these sorts of things. But I just feel like, um, you guys shouldn't be like fighting for table scraps when like there's, there's, you can people can do better, um, and we should expect better. Um, I remember Le- uh, this is um recently Leona um Star Mongoose got into it on a Reddit thread about like people who were mad about Ayudin, <laughs> um having gen having like. D- different. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even even look at the Reddit thread. I don't know what they were mad about. But you know, they send send her back this long screed about how if you want representation, you know, you could use your own creativity and create it. Just just let us have this space where we can continue to be bigoted assholes. Yeah, um, we, we yeah. exist. Stop erasing us, please. Thank you. Yeah, that's that, that, and that's exactly it. The people who don't want these things challenged are people who've never had to are people who've never experienced oppression in their lives and consider any alteration to their status quo to be some kind of attack on their identity. And it's like, no, just let people do things. Let people exist in these spaces. I I think with, I think with that, it's like the, um, they're, they're so resistant to it because like those of us who do not fit like the demographic with which, um, games were like, you know, the video game industry 
purposefully geared games towards, you know, 20 to 35 year old single men, et cetera, you know, who are middle class, you know, who are you know, middle class upper. Um, and like, you know, we've had to experience those um, narratives and we had to experience those mm-hmm. narratives for those people a lot. And then when there's one game that's mm-hmm. just saying, let's not have that and let's have you, the dominant class, have to be in the shoes of someone who is not you. And there's this big blowback about it. And it's like, we've had to do this for the entirety of our lives. And you can't even give us one. Yeah. And it is getting better. But that experience is still something that's very frustrating. That was a lot. <laughs> Sorry. I, it's a heavy, no, 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 it's a heavy discussion. You guys, you guys, you guys did great. I, I'm really glad to hear this, hear your perspectives on this. I, like I said, I, I don't have the experiences that you guys have had with this. All I can do is listen and try to be better. Jed's next question. <laughs> now, I... This is going to sound a little silly. Um, I'm, I'm not going to... I, I have made sort of original content RPGs uh, that I that I even uh, d- detailed in a blog. The question was, uh, if you have you created your own RPG in your head, basically theory, theory crafted a whole system? Um, I did one of these... I, I, I've done these over the years, and one time I sort of turned it into a slightly D and D like game with neighborhood children. And Aww. my 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 neighborhood was a basically a cul de sac, and one st- street coming off of it, there was seven or eight of us. Where there was uh, one person my my age, and then about six kids that were three to four years within five years younger than us, say. And I got a bunch of them that liked video games together, and basically had them play out one of my RPG ideas and it 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 was basically cobbled together from other JRPGs that I that I loved when I was mm-hmm. in say 6th or 7th grade when that when all this happened and uh I, 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 it ended up me getting frustrated with one kid, him leaving the group in a huff, and me hastily ending the game by giving a final boss for the kids that were, that were staying in the game. It was, it, it, it did not have the happiest ending. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've done, I, I have done, uh, things like this. I'm not, I don't want to share all of the specifics. Uh, but, uh, Alana, imagine, imagine, um, Skies of Arcadia, but with more elemental magic technology. And that, that, that's, that'll give you an idea of what, of what Visegard was like. <laughs> oh, you knew even back then. Yeah, it was, it was right when I played it for the first time. When I was maybe, when I was maybe 17 and the other kids in the, in the neighborhood were in the 12, 13, 14 range. I definitely mm-hmm. dreamt of a seventh moon kingdom. That was about as far as I ever mm-hmm. got. But yeah. When, um. There was a friend of my my my, uh, my partner um, now. Um, we've known each other since we were kids, and we used to play pretend when we were little um, in our neighborhood. Um, and so we would do like you know a fantasy adventure stuff with like toy swords and stuff like that. Um, and that um, kind of fictional universe that we like played around in sort of became the basis for a lot of stories I've written over the years. Um, and at one point. I had a, a, I made like a faux design doc for like, okay, what if I turn this into like a 16 bit JRPG? Um, it didn't get very far, but I do know that, it, um, I had I, ideas for like, okay, well, if this, if I ever actually like, I don't know, learn how to use RPG Maker, um, I need to hit up, um, uh, Sal- Mike Salvato, our editor in chief, and get him to make like a green shield icon for like an ultimate, sh- uh, an ultimate <laughs> weapon or something. Um, uh, and I thought that'd be pretty fun. <laughs> I have a design doc and a and like kind of a pitch that I've been working on for a bit um for for a couple of months basically for a um a game that's inspired by Persona and the Persona dancing games but kind of as a historical thing um mm. about like the about the ballroom scene of the 70s that's and dope. 80s and so I have some like I have a doc for that and I haven't made much progress on it over um, the past couple of months because uh, I have a friend who's an artist who is um, who is making the characters for it, but I don't like I don't have the money to pay them right now. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to have you work on this, and then it'd be like a bit of time until I pay you. Like I'd want for that to happen concurrently with when you're actually working on it. So, yeah, I don't know if anything will ever come of that. Uh, I don't know if I'll have, like, a, a build that I make of it, but um, it's cool to it's cool to fantasize and dream about, right? 
Definitely. It sounds yeah. amazing. That's an incredible actually. idea. I would be really interested. Yeah. 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 Make make this. I want yeah, to play it out. <laughs> no pressure. I mean, you guys are all way more creative than me. The answer is not really. One time I was like 10 and I started writing a book that was really just a rip off of like a blend of Breath of Fire and Secret of Evermore. And don't ask me how those two things work together. Um, and that's about the closest I've come to, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I'm not, not that creative. So I, I haven't done too much with that. That's good. I like all your ideas. They're really cool. Oh, my other thing I wanted to point out is that I wanted to make a super boss for the game that was a dragon made out of black holes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sure. Okay. I, Sweet. You know, I have I have seen much l- less, much sillier things as final boss, including the RPG that we're playing next month. Um, <laughs> have, have, have fun uh. with that. Uh, but, uh, okay, oh, Jed- daddy issues. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Jed's third question. Are there any games that you love to do on Retro Encounter, but logistically aren't feasible? Uh, yes, and there are basically two reasons whenever I say no to a game on Retro Encounter. Uh, generally, we have, a, we have a big board of ideas uh, and suggestions that anyone on staff can add to, and then I will choose multiple games every month and like uh and message the regular panelists and or new panelists and have basically the entire site staff vote on what we want the next game to be and we do this usually about two or two and a half months in advance and some things i just won't put on polls for a regular game journal game because they aren't feasible to beat in a few months like uh, we, we did dedicated episodes to persona 3 and xenoblade because those are 100 hour games or 80 to 100 hour games that uh, it's it's an unfair ask to have a group of people coordinate and play those in a month or a month and a half um also because people like RPG fan are people with lives who don't always have the time to play an RPG in a month and and are maybe playing other video games they want to be playing right yeah i mean even when we did cold steel we had to start basically a month ahead mm-hmm. of time so i want we wanted to do cold steel for the podcast but i basically gave everyone an extra month and i still barely finished the game yeah. in time i think sweet kid five was probably <laughs> yeah. my toughest one that's like a 72 75 hour game and that was that was that was Jeez. rough to do in a month <laughs> we did yeah. have some advance notice on yeah. that one because it was uh it was part of the episode 200 vote but still like we we avoid super super long uh, games for monthly game journals for that reason, and uh, but but we I'm not against having an, a, again a single episode dedicated to it where we don't necessarily have to play the game that month, uh, w- which again we did for Xenoblade and a few other games. But but the other logistic logistical difficulty is access, and we've mentioned it a couple times on this podcast even how games like Vandal Hearts are rare games that's not easy to track down a copy, and also isn't available digitally easily. So and of course you could use piracy or other methods to play games that way but w- for the spirit of the podcast is we play a game a month and other and listeners could potentially play along with us uh and if 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 a game that has limited ac- legal accessibility makes it harder for uh, readers to get um, listeners to get a hold of them and harder for our own staff to get a hold of them legally and we don't want to encourage piracy even though of course piracy happens and i'm not going to say that i've never pirated a video game before right. so yeah, those are really the two conditions access and game length and uh i, I would uh, we're going to talk about it again alana skies of arcadia <laughs> Um, yeah. it, it's, it's not available digitally anywhere. The GameCube copy is very rare. Um, very few people own a Dreamcast anymore, and I don't want to encourage people to download Dreamcast emulators. But the moment, the, the month that game becomes available digitally somehow, if it ever happens, we will start planning an episode for it, probably the following month. I know. And Sega's actually really guilty of it anyway, because like they're basically mm-hmm. the poster child for inaccessible, expensive games, aka Panzer Dragoon Saga. Like right? I would love to play Panzer Dragoon Saga again. I do not remember a single thing about it, and I played it with my brother when it first came out in nineteen ninety eight. Remember loving it. Do I remember a thing about it? No, not really. So I'd love the chance to be able to do it, but you know, the Sega Saturn is one an incredibly difficult system to port games from because of the technology of that system, and two, I think they may have lost the assets to um, Panzer Dragoon Saga. I'm not totally sure on that, but yeah. And three, it's like three hundred and seventy pounds to buy in the UK. Mm-hmm. Well, it was one of the rarest RPGs that did yeah. that that did, that did receive a uh, English language localization. Yeah. 
So, uh, anyone else have a, a game that they would love to do for Retro Encounter but isn't really feasible? Uh, I, I mean, I said Skies of Arcadia. We mentioned Vandal Hearts. I mean, yeah, it's just really long stuff like your like Xenoblade. Like, I, would I would I love to do like a Xenoblade Chronicles like as a game journal? Sure. Would it be way too long? Probably. Yeah. Or cross. Yeah, cross especially because like that game has like no real end. Like, mm. listeners, they mean Xenoblade Chronicles Cross, not Chrono Cross. We already did episodes <laughs> of Chrono Cross. Yes, we did. Um, Chrono and, and they were and Chrono Cross is a wonderful game, and also not too long. Okay, so let's move on to Jed's final question. This episode's panel is now a JRPG party. What class job are each of us? Are we balanced? Um, I'm going to make some rules for this because I love making playing stupid games with stupid made up rules. <laughs> Um, each of us is going to have to be a class or job uh, that's found in a JRPG somewhere. It doesn't have to be one specific game. Uh, it's a five-character pa- battle system, so we're all playing. Um, but the other four people discuss each person's job. So for my, for my job, uh, Alana, Joe, Peter, Zach discuss who it is. For Alana's job, myself, Joe, Peter, Zach discuss who it is. Uh, let's try to not waste too much time doing this, but uh, th- 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 that's that's the rules of the game. Um, so, uh, okay, Alana seems stressed out, so she gets to go first. Oh, no, no! <laughs> uh, so, everyone besides Alana, what do we think Alana's JRPG jo- uh, part, um, job is? Mm, I'm thinking the, the Red Mage from 14. Oh. Maybe. I like I like that a lot of versatility as well. A lot, yeah, a lot of versatility. Yeah. I think Alana would rock the red coat and the rapier. Definitely the cool hats, the coolest mm-hmm. hats. I would agree with the fashion <laughs> statement. Mm-hmm. Alana is a Jill of all trades type, but I think Alana likes spear characters. I do, but I'm not very physically strong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking some kind of mage character at least. How about how about like a magic fighter, like a red mage? That can cast a lot of different spells, but just wears a, has like a Spartan style spear and shield <laughs> to protect herself. So like a Rosa, but instead of having a bow and arrow, have a spear. I can do that. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe. Based on your answers about baking, I was thinking about the patissier from uh, <laughs> from Bravely Brave Second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. awesome. Great choice. Yeah. Well, really second. Yeah. Oh, Alana, would you be offended if we made your uh, weapons a like a wooden spoon and a carving knife? So you're telling me I'm Lilith from Tales of Destiny, aren't yes. you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Either Lilith from Destiny or Lena from Chrono Cross. You know, when I was thinking about this question and thought, oh, we'd be assigning ourselves job roles, I either thought, thought in my head, summon a white mage or patissiery. So, you know, patissier. All right. Alana, you're, uh, you are our um, <laughs> baker mage class. <laughs> You can uh, you can heal us with uh, with baked goods or poison enemies with uh, with you know devil food cake. Cool. Uh, so it's Joe's turn. Oh, no. uh, everyone besides Joe, what do we think Joe's Shoot. RPG job is? Uh, Joe mm. Joe is definitely some kind of music based class. Um, I'm thinking like, yeah. like Nikki from Chrono yeah. Cross. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, could st- we could stay in bravely. We could stay in bravely second and make Joe the. Uh, uh, the, oh, what, what's the, uh, what's the pop idol class called? Performer. Yeah, the performer class. <laughs> um, where singing, uh, boosts allies and, dist- and distracts enemies. I like it. I like it too. <laughs> we could just make all of this briefly <laughs> second. <laughs> I'm just, uh, joke, we're, we're already knocking on the door. Joe, Joe can be, um, like Yuna from, from Ten Two with like the, the song, the songstress, uh, dress oh, sphere. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, which mm. which is funny because like you know my avatar in the site and stuff is now Yuna. There you so. go. Oh, nice. there we go. Pretty See? Funny. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So music mage, songstress slash singer slash performer <laughs> is uh, is Joe's job class. Now uh, let's Zach's turn. Everyone besides Zach, what do we think Zach's ideal job uh, RPG job is? Oh. Uh, it, <laughs> hmm. I, See, well, I'm like leaning towards your 14 class. <laughs> like, well, I know that I know that Zach enjoys ninjas. That's true, but RPGs. I am not very dexterous. Cool. There's no way I could be a ninja. <laughs> no. I know that Zach is an English teacher and an educator, mathematician. Oh, like not the calculator math. The, <laughs> oh, the, the, well, the arithmetic. The arithmetic. Nah, I'm not good at math. Well, yeah. hmm. well, Zach, Zach may be a teacher, but. 
but he he moonlights as a prince of darkness. He is <laughs> he he's a he's a dark knight slash dragoon yeah. sort of sort of guy. <laughs> All right, uh, how about this? How about a how about we go maximum edge? And he's a dark knight who uses some form of sword or blade. But uh, recites romantic poetry <laughs> as as he as he picks exactly. what, so what, 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 what I wanted to be when I was like, like sixteen. Uh, so congratulations. I would say you're you're basically <laughs> Sammy you're basically Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction, but with a sword. I was I was God, I was gonna yeah. go with V from Devil May Cry Five. Oh, oh yeah yeah yeah. Christ. I don't know much about this character. I love I love I love, um, I love he, V. He looks like Timothy Chalamet on crack. <laughs> <laughs> v, I'll recites, take that compliment. v recites poetry and then has uh and then has like a shadow wolf and shadow golem uh attack people while he okay. says poetry I can, I can live with that all right so okay we'll, we'll make zach a dark knight with a literature <laughs> bent um okay uh it's peter's turn now oh, uh everyone besides peter what do we think peter's ideal job class is Ooh. Uh, I, you know, I am thinking uh, this is maybe low hanging fruit, Peter, but the duelist from Seventh Dragon VFD. Yes. Yeah. They they uh, they play they play cards to um summon to summon creatures for different elemental combo spells. Yeah, I think that or like any dual wielder, because my brain's just going to Roxas from Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> mm, okay. Mm. Okay, so let's say cards in one hand, keyblade in the other hand, cards for elemental magic, keyblade key blade for elemental whackage. Yeah, I feel like we're just <laughs> describing Ace from Final Fantasy Type Zero now, aren't we? Yeah. yeah, you know what? Yeah, I don't think I don't think I don't think Peter objects to that either, does he? I don't he? object either. Ace is like one of my favorite Final Fantasy characters. <laughs> All right, um, we'll just uh, simplify it a little bit. Card mage slash duelist plays cards for powerful spells is what Peter is, and. Oh boy, I have some. I may have some regrets. Uh, it's my turn. I'll stay silent for a minute while you guys decide what my JRPG class is. I it mean, might be. It might be lightly on. interested. Uh, it might be um, lightly informed from your Final Fantasy fourteen stuff, but also because of your love of fighting games, like a monk character. Yeah, I think so. I was trying to think if I could think of any any classes that resembled superheroes or you know maybe some sentai i'm not pulling anything out of the top of my head though at the moment so there are a couple in disgaea <laughs> all right i haven't played disgaea I say basically we could, just uh, beautiful joe <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would say yeah we make we make mike like the party monk but we put him in sentai armor <laughs> Why not? Yeah, you're, you're you're like the monk class with the equip heavy from Final Fantasy Tactics. There you go. Very good. <laughs> this is a little bit like a Disgaea bouncer, a little bit like a Disgaea masked hero class, and a little bit like the Red Ranger from uh, Chroma Squad. <laughs> I mean, the Rams, the Ram, the Rams a monk strategy for uh, for Tactics is is legit. He just turns into One Punch Man. So, uh, yep, that's how I played the game. <laughs> yep, it's the it's the best way. <laughs> Ramza is super strong no matter how you build him, almost. But he's really satisfying in that kind of build. Okay, I think we've settled on something. So, uh... I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll save those, uh, those for, for recitation in a a few minutes, but, um, thank you, Jed, for that, uh, for that email with some really amusing questions and, and serious questions. Uh, and also with it for your suggestion, which was Shining Force 2. So... Uh, that that was the final email. We got sent 15 emails and have something like 55 or 60 game suggestions. Oh gosh! And I'm going to have a sip of my beverage here and try to rapid fire say all of them at once in just a moment. Hold on. You're the most skilled at this. <laughs> I know. I can be a bit of a motor mouth when I focus, so I'm going to do my best. <clears throat> game suggestions for Retro Encounter 250. 3D Dot Game Heroes, Ark the Lad 1 and 2, Bahamut Lagoon, Bite and Kaidos, Bloodborne, Boktai, Brave Fister Musashi, Breath of Fire 3, Breath of Fire Dragon Quarter, Castlevania Game, Dark Cloud 2, Der Languisar, Dragon Quest Game, Fantasy Life, Final Fantasy 5, Final Fantasy 9, Final Fantasy 10 2, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, Final Fantasy Tactics 8 2, Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, Front Mission, Grandia, Grandia 2, 3, Dot Head Infection, Harvest Moon or Story of Seasons Game, Kingdom Hearts 2, Legend of Gaia, Legend of Mana, Live Alive, Lost Kingdoms, Lunar Knights, Magical Vacation, Marvelous Another Treasure Island, Mega Man X Command Mission, Mega Man Battle Network, Muramas and the Demon Blade, Odin Sphere, Ogre Battle 64, Paper Mario, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, Phantom Brave, Radiata Stories, Radiant Historia, Rogue Galaxy, Rune Factory 4, Shining Force 2, Sonic Chronicles, The Dark Brotherhood, Soma Bringer, Threads of Fate, Thousand Arms, Treasure Hunter Dream, Treasure of the Rubens, Vandal Hearts, Way of the Samurai, Xenosaga Episode 1, another East game. Cool. Heck yeah. I, uh, 
I stumbled a little bit, but I promise there was no fast forward technology used for that. Uh, that's about, I think, I think I counted it. It was 56 games for the podcast. So the next step is each of us, uh, five panelists chooses one of those games. And then we make a five, a list of five possible games for a future retro encounter uh, uh, episode, which I think will be uh, December or January. And uh, that that becomes a public poll, which we release at the same time as this podcast. So, does anyone want to volunteer their first pick for the list? I mean, I can go. I um, this is any Dragon Quest game. I think it's time for us to, to fully game journal a Dragon Quest game again. I'm going to go Dragon Quest three. All right, Dragon Quest three originally on the NES, and I think also the MSX. I think they talked about Probably. porting it. I think that they. I don't think they did with three. I think they did with one. Uh, okay, maybe 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 it's just a uh, I, I, one was definitely yeah. on the MSX. I'm yeah. not sure about others. Okay, so any, does anyone else have a game to volunteer? I, I haven't decided myself. I'm I'm still looking over all of these. Yeah. I'll probably I'm probably down to do another Ease game. Um, I've got a few of those that I um, need to catch up on. I, I've had E Seven for ages and I haven't touched it. Ooh, E Seven for real? As in my maybe my second favorite East game? Yeah, I have it on. I have it on my Vita. I just haven't uh, haven't actually played it yet. So, so is that is that is that your is that your pick, or you're gonna? I'll um, do it think for my pick. Some sure, I'll do it for my pick. All right, East Seven. Man, something I might have. I might can't have believe used you didn't for my pick Kingdom Hearts too, Peter. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as much as I love watching Mike suffer, <laughs> <laughs> I don't that's, think that's you'd an, suffer with two though. That's two the thing. That, that's that's another game on our big list, and I and I have heard that's the best one. So maybe I would suffer considerably less than my suffering for Kingdom Hearts one. Well, I think probably so. Yeah, Joe or Alana, do you have a um, an idea to submit? I'm bouncing back and forth between between two games. Uh... <laughs> Um, uh, do you want me to go? It might, uh, I don't think I don't know if it'll eliminate one, but no, go, go for it. Go for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to put Baton Kytos down. Um, Baton Kytos. I think Kytos. we have enough people interested on the site to play it. It is a bit of an accessibility issue, but I think enough people have it who want to play it that I am totally down to play it. And I think I think people need to see some monolith games that and try crescendo games as well, like that are not as you know based or anything like that and i think button kytos is one of the weirder games we could cover and i think there's a lot of topics i would love to talk about about that game okay so joe and i remain i think i have come to it and uh because uh it's because i've never played it and uh it is probably my partner's favorite game so uh paper mario the thousand year door all right oh, timely too good choice it's so good yeah <laughs> Okay. Now I don't have my usual go-tos of trying to sneak Disgaea onto the list. Uh and we already have a Dragon Quest <laughs> game up there. I'm going to go a slightly odd direction and pick an Atlas game that maybe we don't think about as even being an Atlas game so much. Uh the From Software Classic 3D Dot Game Heroes. Huh. Uh, I I played the beginning of that game many years ago, uh, and I I got stuck. I'm probably halfway through. It was the big fire dungeon, and it, it's basically it's a send up of Dragon Quest and Zelda that I enjoyed a lot but never finished. And I think it was one of the games on Mike Wooten's giant list of submissions. So that that's the list uh, chosen by the literary dark knight Zach Wilkerson at Dragon Quest Three, chosen by the duelist mage Peter Treisenberg E Seven. Chosen by the magical baker, Alana Hagues, Baton Kaitos. Chosen by the rock star uh, performer, Joe Padilla, Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. And uh, by the masked superhero, um, puncher man, Mike Solosi, 3D Dot Game Heroes. That is the list that we are going to submit um, for, li- for listeners. Have it up for about two weeks. And uh, the winner of, the, of that public poll will be a future Retro Encounter Game Journal game. We're almost at the end. <laughs> 200, uh, 250 episodes. It's a, it's a, it's a landmark. And um, I mean, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much for taking so much time out of your day, uh, Alana, Joe, Zach, Peter, for this. Uh, I mean, Retro Encounter has been a big part of my life since 2015, especially since 2017, when I, t- when I took over running the show. And um, I guess in about 40 more weeks, we'll have to start thinking about what to do for episode 300. <laughs> No, I, I mean, thank you for having us. Like, yeah, for sure. Person, it like it started the year I joined, and 
it's basically brought me out of my shell. Like, listening to my first episode to now is ridiculous. Like, the amount I've changed and the amount everybody else has changed as well is really incredible. And it's kind of testament to everybody who gets involved in this, and especially you, Mike, because, like, you run the show. You're always really enthusiastic about it, and you're never willing to shoot anybody down for anything. So like, thank you so much for continuing to produce something that's so fun. And like, I've made lifelong friends through RPG fan, but I think especially through this podcast, like I would never have had the courage to come to E3 from the UK. Like if I hadn't spoken to anybody on these podcasts and I certainly wouldn't have had the courage to open up to certain people in the ways that I have on the site, if it wasn't for this podcast. So personally, thank you for just being such a, damn awesome person and friend to me and everybody oh damn how do i respond to that (laughs) (laughs) you don't you just ignore it (laughs) well you're gonna have to you're gonna have to deal with more uh, because uh i also want to throw in a personal note of just thanking you for running this podcast and i you know this podcast and just kind of being really a big fan of it um was what brought me to the site to start um, going on RPG fan site, which brought me to one day seeing um, that there was a position opening for a social media person. Um, And honestly, this like joining RPG fan and everything has really changed my life in a, like in a really positive way. Um, You know, I, I really vibe with what Alana said about bringing me out of my shell. Um, there's, it's been really great to find a community of people who, um, who share a lot of my same interests, um, and are just really kind, um, accepting and supportive of anything, you know, just, you know, Mike, you having me on these podcasts or, or, you know, Zach being like, yeah, seriously, write whatever you want and I'll publish it. <laughs> Um, or just, or Peter guiding me through games and talking about, um, you know, career issues with Alana. I mean, it's just been really, um, wonderful. So thank you for being an impetus and a continued part of me kind of coming out of my shell and growing up. We're glad to have you, Joe. Thanks. Thanks for being (laughs) cool, Mike. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I'll echo, I'll echo the sentiments. I mean, like RPG fans have been a big part of my life since I joined and, um, it's been great being a part of this podcast. I've met some really great lifelong friends here. Um, and I'm glad, and it's still something I keep, I keep at it and love doing to this day. And so thank you for being a part of that and for having me on. Uh, Zach, do you want to say something? Should I start? I mean, I, I've said to you privately how, uh, how, how much, uh, I enjoy the show and how much I appreciate you. So, <laughs> All right. Verbal sentiment's not a strong suit of mine. All right, we can leave it at that. Uh, thank you, all four of you and everyone that's been on the show. Um, I, I was, I've been super interested in podcasts for over a decade. I started following RPG because of the podcasts and even sending in slightly, slightly obnoxious emails <laughs> to, um, epi- to episodes <laughs> of Random Encounter in 2013 and 2014, eventually joining the site for myself uh, that year. Uh, I've, I've made many lifelong friends gone to uh gone to conventions gone to broadway musicals with rpg fan people uh and i i think that podcasts about video games are a dime a dozen there there's hundreds if not thousands or tens of thousands but i think that the rpg fan staff and community is so special that when i started doing podcasts it's like these are just a great a great a group of great people who have a shared interest with me and we should have as many of them speaking on podcasts as we can. So part of the idea of Retro Encounter was a podcast not tied to current events that got as many people from RPG Fan as possible on the show. And although it, we have, you know, zeroed in on this, on, I would say maybe the do- a, a dozen most common vo- voices that are on the podcast often, but it, it, it's just a, a group of people that I've grown to truly love and I love nothing more than to talk about video games with them. And thank you for the continued opportunity to keep doing that. So without further ado, next week on Retro Encounter, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're doing another Quiz Show episode. Uh, um, uh, Zach is going to try and see if the third time is the char- charm and three other contestants will be uh, vying with him for the crown of, of Quiz Show winner. 
Um, it's it's patterned after Ask Me Another and a few other specific quiz shows. And um, if you want to see how that'll go, you can please listen to the two 2019 episodes of the quiz show. They were really fun to record, but require extra preparation from me. So I need to get back to writing quiz questions immediately after we stop recording. Uh, but after the quiz show in September, we're doing a full month of Persona content. We're going to have an ep- uh, two episodes on Persona 2, Innocent Sin, which Alana and Joe, I believe you're playing the hell right now. Zach, Zach too, yep. right? I mean, I actually, yeah. I have not quite started it yet, but I'm going to probably today, actually, later today. So, yeah. Right on. So 60% of the pa- of this panel is going to be on those Persona 2 Innocent Sin episodes next month. Also in September, we're doing an episode on Persona music. But, but Salosi, you ask, there's already another podcast about, about music. Why, is Retro Encounter stepping on Rhythm Encounter's corner? No, it isn't. Because R- Rhythm Encounter is coming back in September. Mm-hmm. But as part of the launch of Rhythm Encounter... Oh. One episode of Random Encounter and one episode of Retro Encounter are going to have dedicated music episodes to maybe direct some tr- uh, subscription traffic to Rhythm Encounter. And we're combining Rhythm Encounter relaunch with Month of Persona and doing an episode all about Persona music. And it's I could not be more excited because I have listened to so much Persona music over the decades. So much. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. I have some th- capital T thoughts. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> And also, in addition to the music episode, we're doing an episode all about a specific Persona 4 character. We talked about a couple Persona 4 characters on this episode, but none of them, spoiler alert, are the murderer. Persona 4 is a game about catching a serial killer, and one Persona character I I can safely call the Persona 4 killer. We're doing an RPG villains episode about the Persona 4 killer, also in September. So if you want to talk about the motivations and complications of that character who is either very well-liked or not well-liked, depending on who you ask. Uh, we got it for you a couple weeks from now. If you want to reach out to us, the best way to do so is email retro at rpgfan.com. It's too late to submit uh, listener questions for episode 250, but you can still submit letters. I share them with all the staff, and we are perfectly happy to continue reading emails on the air. So please send your emails to retro at rpgfan.com. RPG Fan has recently had a site relaunch, but we still have... In addition to that shiny new site, message boards, a Facebook page, an Instagram page, a Twitter page, a Discord server, a Twitch channel with something streaming every day. Leona um, is also going to be on this Persona uh, 2 episodes, and she's been uh, streaming Persona 2 off and on over the past couple of weeks. So uh, please check out everything that RPG Fan has to offer, including three other podcasts, the aforementioned Rhythm Encounter about RPG Fan music, relaunching very soon. So hit that subscribe button and get ready for some music episodes coming in September. Also, Random Encounter, about a bi-weekly podcast about randomness, and Phoenix Edge, a weekly podcast that's mostly focused on current events in RPGs, not current events around the world. There's, yeah, oh boy, there's plenty of other content about that. But uh, please review Retro Encounter and those other three podcasts on iTunes or Google Play or whatever podcast listening venue you use. We love feedback. We want all the feedback. So Twitter, social media, how can listeners reach us directly? Let's tell them, starting with uh, Magic Baker Alana. Um, I might change my Twitter handle now, actually. Um, but at the moment, uh, I am at Alana Higgs on Twitter. It's probably the best way to get hold of me. Um, you can also find me on the RPG Fan Discord as Alana. And... Dark Knight Poet Zach. Uh, you can email me at ZachW at RPGFan.com, or you can find me on Discord at ZachW. And ready to duel at a moment's notice, Peter. Doro Monstercado. You can reach me on Twitter at I Have Fury, or you can email me, Peter T, at RPGFan.com. And hyper glam rock star performer Joe. You can find me on Instagram or Twitter as at EvaList. And if you want to listen to me, someone who enjoys masked superheroes very, very much, you can find me on Twitter at the Real Monsoon most of the time at Evoker for Dogs, other times and Monsoon Mike on RPG Fans Discord. So I'm not going to say here's to 250 more because that is scary, <laughs> but here's to many, many more podcasts. Thank you so much, Alana, Joe, Peter, Zach. Thank you so much, listeners. Good night and good luck. <laughs>